Okay. Uh, dear colleagues, um, hello, and, and uh, thank you for joining uh, our second day on digital dentistry program. Uh, our topics today are um, digital impression in dental implantology by Dr. Mahia Hassanzadeh, patient-specific subperiosal implants uh, surgical part by uh, Dr. Ghulam Reza Shirani, patient-specific subperiosal implants uh, prosthetic part by Dr. Mahnaz Arshad. And then after break, we have di uh, digital workflow for immediate loading by Dr. Faiz Atri, and then implant surgical guides from past to, to the present by Dr. Mahza Mohajari and then consideration of laboratory procedures in digital implantology by uh, Dr. Reza Shahmiri from Australia, and then um, precision dentistry by uh, Dr. Ahmad Solari uh, from uh, New York. And uh, Dr. Solari uh, uh, want to have an um, interactive um, presentation with the audiences. Now um, we ask uh, our colleague, Dr. Um, our young colleague, Dr. Mahia Hassanzadeh, uh, prostodontist, assistant professor in Department of Prostodontics, School of Dentistry, uh, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, to uh, start uh, her presentation. Dr. Uh, Hassanzadeh, the screen is yours. Welcome to our program. Okay, uh, hello everybody, uh, good morning. I hope that you have enjoyed the first day of the program. And uh, let me start the second day with the uh, interesting topic of uh, impression of digital cases for implant dentistry. As we know, digital dental technology has evolved rapidly since the introduction of the computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, I mean CAD-CAM process in 1980s. By definition, CAD-CAM uh, consists of uh, three elements, computer-aided data acquisition, uh, data processing and design, and uh, data manufacturing. Data acquisition is usually done with intraoral scanners or uh, top scanners. Data processing uh, is done with different um, designing softwares which are available in the market like Exacad. And finally, making the physical model from virtual data is possible via milling machines or printers. If we want to do a simple implant case from A to Z by uh, digital workflow, First of all, uh, we should uh, do with diagnostic uh, stage and then going for prosthetic planning, surgical planning, and final prosthetic design and uh, prosthetic fabrication. For the last two stages, I mean final uh, processes design and fabrication, uh, the first step of uh, fabrication is making impressions. Dental impressions are uh, a crucial step in implant dentistry. Inaccurate transfer of the implant position can, uh, can lead to ill-fitting processes, which may ultimately result in both mechanical and biological complication. As you know, in conventional method, we use impression coppings, impression materials, and trays for transferring the position of the implants. This is why intraoral scanners and scan bodies are used in, in digital method. Uh, compared to conventional impression technique, the digital workflow uh, eliminates some uh, procedures such as tray selection, dispensing and setting of impression material, um, disinfection, uh, stone cast production and transportation, which, may, which might help improve the uh, time efficiency and a higher acceptance of patient was reported with dental digital uh, impressions. 
Uh, besides of this advantage, uh, digital impressions are uh, transferred to virtual models and stored in electronic databases, um, which facilitate the uh, communication between the clinician and dental technician. So in the continuation of this lecture, uh, we will talk about digital method. The digital method can be either direct or indirect in nature. The indirect workflow involves making a conventional implant impression, uh, and then we digitalize the impression or the stone cast uh, by using an optical benchtop scanner and laboratory scan bodies. The direct workflow uh, includes the use of intraoral scan bodies and uh, intraoral scanning device to generate a digital scan directly from the patient's mouth. If I want to start uh, the direct workflow with the history of this technique, I should say that in 1994, a technique was first described uh, measuring the 3D position of dental implant by using photogrammetry. Uh, research showed that this technique showed a level of uh, precision similar to conventional method and uh, was valid option for recording uh, the implant position in orally, which has subsequently been confirmed. Photogrammetry is a method of making precise measurements by using reference points within photographs without any contact with the uh, measured object. A recent uh, a stereo photogrammetric system has been developed for capturing implant position called Precise Implant Capture, PIC or PIC. The perform, uh, to perform the PIC method, the professional needs a, a stereo a stereoscopic camera or PIC camera to record the implant position and first the code of the PIC abutment uh, that you can see in the slides. The, black one, which is uh, dotted with uh, white dots, uh, must be entered into a software program uh, and then placed on each abutment. Then the peak camera is uh, placed 50 to 30 centimeters away uh, from the dental arc and uh, with an angle of maximum 45 degree in relation to the transfer. The information captured from the photogrammetric a photogrammetric abutment in the camera can then be processed and uh, can be saved and exported as SCL files. After that, in 2004, the first digitally scannable implant components were introduced by using an innovative coded healing abutment by 3i company. Um, this uh, coded healing abutment um, provide 3D information on the implant location in relation to the adjacent teeth and opposing dentition and surrounding soft tissue. Uh, but the studies about the accuracy of this component was controversial and it needs more research. And finally, the first scannable impression copings were released shortly afterward and uh, were termed scan bodies by the Schumann Group. Initially, scan bodies uh, were commercially available only for a single implant system, I mean Schumann, and required a specific scanner and a scanning, a scanning technology. But shortly after, uh, most of dental implant manufacturers have developed their own scan bodies and the corresponding digital libraries of implants and abutments to allow users to create digital implant supported restoration. So uh, implant scan bodies are components used as markers to transmit the uh, three-dimensional position of the dental implants into the CAD software. As you can see in this slide, uh, today almost all major implant manufacturers offer scannable impression copies, uh, as do numerous dental laboratories and dental implant accessory companies. And commercial uh, implant scan, uh, intraoral scan bodies design is highly variable with regards to material, shape, size, surface, connection, reusability, software, and scanner compatibility, and cost. But although the high variable uh, in size and shape, uh, all the scan bodies generally consist of three distinct components. The upper uh, portion, 
called the scan region, the middle portion known as the body, and the most apical portion known as the base. Uh, scan bodies are smaller than laboratory scan bodies due to the space uh, constraints inside the oral cavity and must be blend uh, and must be uh, hand tightened into the implant. Uh, as you can see, the scan body contains uh, at its top uh, position a geometric shape or visual pattern that will be compared with digital dental library in the software, and if there is a match between the scan body and the implant uh, library, a, a unique signature is created within the uh, three-dimensional coordination for the dental implant and referred to other implants and the other uh, surrounding oral tissue. On the opposite side of the scan body and me on the bottom of the scan body, uh, the uh, interface is designed to match one specific implant brand or connection type. Therefore, the um, user must be sure to use the correct scan body for each dental uh, implant. And if a dental implant is scanned with the incorrect scan body, a new scan would be required because dental technician uh, is not able to repair the mistake in the software in this stage. Um, so uh, you can see in the, this uh, picture the scan region of different types of scan bodies. The scan region may contain one or multiple scan areas which may improve the accuracy of digital scan. This portion is usually made of the same material as the body and is made of a variety of materials, including polyethylether cation, peak, titanium alloys, uh, aluminum alloys, and various resins. The, machin the machinability of these uh, materials and the manufacturing tolerance may be an important consideration in the accuracy of scan bodies. And about the base, uh, the base is responsible for creating the mating surface between implant and intraoral scan bodies and may or may not be the same material as the body. A deeply tapered connection or mismatch in materials between the base and the implant may influence displacement of a uh, scan body when tightened into the place and wear of these components through repeated use and sterilization may cause changes in the position over time, uh, which is problematic as the overall fit of any scan bodies is a decisive factor for, your high, um, for a high precision transfer of the implant position into the software. And currently, the scan bodies require the use of intraoral scanners to uh, collect raw data in the form of point clouds, uh, which represents the 3D coordinates in the X, Y, and Z uh, planes of the digital digitized surface. Once captured accurately, a digital implant analog can then be placed in a digital model with specific implant um, libraries and dentistry. A specific CAD software is used to fabricate the restoration. But the overall quality of digitized data depends prim primarily on the measuring system used, I mean the intraoral scanner. And another important factor is uh, the effect of uh, point, cloud, point cloud density um, and the characteristics of the surface to be scanned, um, which uh,
Uh, sorry for interruption. Uh, we have a, a problem with internet. Uh, we will start soon after uh, uh, fixing the problem. Please stay with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Hassan, would you please talk? I don't know if Hassan is really didn't you? Do you have my voice? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have your voice. Okay. It's a talk. Okay. Okay. So the overall quality of the digitized depends primarily on the measuring system used. And another important factor that can affect the point cloud density is the characteristic of the surface to be scanned. I mean, the shape of the scan body and the material of the a scan body. Dull, smooth, and opaque surfaces are easier to scan and than shiny, rough, or translucent ones, which can especially uh, be problematic uh, in the mouth. The studies have indicated that deep, undercut, steep, sharp, angled, or crowded surfaces are more difficult to scan, leading to less accurate point clouds. So if you uh, tighten a scan body in the oral cavity and do the scanning and you have your data in the software, then you can continue uh, with digital or analog uh, fabrication of the uh, restorations. In digital, you will uh, design your avulsements, your framework and your restoration in the CAD CAM software and go uh, fully, uh, fully digital or in uh, analog uh, workflow, you will print or mill your model with implant analog generated and go conventional for fabrication of the restorations. If an analog cast is necessary, for example, when the application of layering porcelain is required, and a steel model can be printed or uh, milled with, with the space for the implant analog to be manually positioned in the proper uh, 3D orientation, and the implant analog is then looted into the model by using uh, special guide grooves or vertical grooves uh, or other uh, key ways. And uh, it's even possible to generate a definitive cast with a printed implant uh, interface or connection. We talk about the usual form of the scan bodies, but we have other type of scan bodies. For example, the nose implant system uh, introduced a combined healing abutment and scan bodies uh, newly. Um, this healing abutment uh, is in place. It's not need uh, to unscrew this. So you just put the healing abutment, uh, you just put the scan body on the uh, top of the healing abutment. And this combined healing abutment and scan body uh, is secured by the friction between the vertical grooves in the healing abutment and the indentation presence on the scan body, uh, which prevents the rotation of the scan body in the healing abutment. Uh, or other types of scan bodies. For example, we have the tribus and scan body and scan post and scan body from Sturman Group. The names of the corresponding tie base and uh, scan posts are very similar and in a uh, sense they can serve the same purpose when trying to capture a digital image intraorally. The scan post and tie base that corresponds to the implant have two characteristics that are exactly the same, the internal connection and um, geometry connections. But there is a, uh, but the scan post you can see in the slide uh, is uh, longer than tie bases. And um, this makes these two components different. Uh, about the tie base, uh, these components, uh, the main purpose of the tie base is to serve as the final titanium base of the hybrid abutment and is a single use only. In CAD, it can be used uh, for imaging of the implant and location and angle when paired with the scan body in the right cases. So you put the scan body on the top of your tie base and go for a scanning and then use your tie base as the final abutment for your hybrid uh, restorations. But about the scan body and the scan uh, post, and this component is an impression post that is used digitally uh, for capturing the location and angle of the implant using the steric Omnicam or BlueCam, and can be and it can be used up to fifty times. 
in order to scan the scan process, scan body is required and fits on the geometry connection. And uh, when imaging, the primary concern is imaging the upper part of the scan body, whereas the size of the scan posts are not important and they are recommended torque for fixing the scan post to the implant is uh, 50 uh, Newton centimeter. But uh, should the scan post or tibus be used for imaging, uh, this decision factor uh, for uh, which to go with uh, is, depends uh, heavily on the how deep the implant is placed. The scan post is longer than tibus. So for implants that are placed deeper into the bone, it's recommended uh, to use a scan post rather than uh, tibus. And uh, some uh, clinical situations that um, we recommend, uh, for example, for if you have limited intraproximal spaces, we should use narrow scan bodies. Or for dentalist patients, you should use shorter scan bodies. And uh, we can also use some pluses to have more uh, characteristics uh, to help uh, scan easier. If we want to review a scanning protocol step by step, uh, first of all, after the second stage of the surgery and uh, passing 10 days later, we go for the scanning. First of all, the software asks you to scan the emergence profile. Uh, after uh, untitling the healing abutment, you should first scan the emergence profile. Then uh, you should go for scan bodies. You should tighten hand and torque the scan bodies in place and scan the uh, scan bodies in place. After that, the opposing arch and uh, the occlusion will be scanned. And for extra scanning, first of all, you should tighten the uh, laboratory scan bodies. Uh, that I told, they are longer than intra scanners. Uh, in the place and scan the, uh, scan the cast. After that, you should put the um, ginger mask in the place and uh, scan the ginger mask. The accuracy of digital impression scans can be affected by the implant angulation, implant depth, or inter-implant distance. And uh, the present finding about the uh, exposed length of a scan body, the effect of this exposed length of a scan body and the accuracy of the uh, implant uh, recording position demonstrate that extra caution is uh, needed when making an impression with an optical scanner for deep, deep implants. Um, um, connecting the intraoral scan bodies directly to the fixture, the accuracy can be increased by connecting a component of uh, supragingival level using a stock abutment or multi-unit abutment first and then performing the digital uh, scan with intraoral scan bodies. So the precision decrease for implant depths uh, of at least uh, three millimeter and the trueness decrease for implant depth of at least 4.5 millimeter. And at the end, um, I wanted uh, to review a case, but I think something problem, they are superimposing each other. Uh, th these pictures are superimposed uh, on each other. Uh, they, it shows that the intraoral scan bodies are tightened in its place, scans, and the restoration is fully uh, digital, digitized uh, and um, designed with tie base and a full contour zirconia restoration. If any questions present, I'm here to ask into i'm here to answer uh, thank you so much uh, uh, dr hassan zade it was very informative and uh, very interesting um uh, i hope our audiences have uh, enjoyed it uh, i don't see any question in the uh, chat box so uh, thank you so much for coming along with us and um, sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan Sadeh. Oh, one chat. Is it yours or? Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, from Zainab uh, Abdul Hadi Al Haydari. Oh, is there a difference between tissue level and bone level? 
I, we have different think... types of scan body for these two types of implant. We should uh, consider the type of the connection of the implant for choosing a scan body. So for bone level scan body, uh, bone level implants, we have uh, different scan body, and for uh, tissue level, we have the other type of scan body. So when you choose your scan body, consider the connection type. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh... No other questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hassan Zadeh. And thank you, Dr. Faith, for all your part in <laughs> international department. Yeah. And thank you. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, 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 my co Good morning, Dr. Hassan Zadeh. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Good morning. So, so I'm here. regarding this topic, uh, do we have a scan body for most of the implant systems in the market recently, or they come for the certain type of the implant systems? Oh, uh, today, uh, almost all manufacturer, implant manufacturer, uh, have their own scan bodies. And um, I think that all of the manufacturers uh, besides the impression copies for conventional metals, offer the scan bodies for digital metals. So we don't have problem in this issue. Great. So regardless of the implant type, it comes in extra uh, external connection or internal connection or more taper connections, uh, the bone level implants versus the uh, tissue level implants. We do have scan body available in the market for each individual systems. Yes, we have all of these uh, types for all of the manufacturer. The, own, the manufacturer itself, uh, and also there are some other companies that uh, launched this uh, scan bodies for mm -hmm. all of the uh, brand implants. For example, uh, there is another question. Company that uh, produced the scan bodies for all of the uh, plants brands, the scan of all of the implant plants. Uh, uh, the depth of the implant position, does it influence on the uh, accuracy of the scan body for how it works for us? Yeah, uh, no, but we have the uh, depth of the implant, one issue, and the exposing length of the scan body is another issue. The top region of the scan body is the most important region for recording the uh, three, uh, 3D uh, position of the implant. So if your uh, implant is more than three millimeters deep, uh, deep consider uh, using a, a long in scan bodies or use a multi-unit abutment on your implant and then fix the scan body that is designed for the multi-unit abutment on the top of it so you can have more accurate scan. Thank you so much. There is another question uh, regarding digital impression. Is it possible for overdentures to use digital impressions both for implants and soft tissue? It is a question from our listener. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible that uh, to have the overdentures uh, with impressions, but the issue is that when you have a dentist's jaw, the markers of the jaw uh, decrease, so you have uh, less uh, characteristics in the jaw to pull. So the scanner have some problems to record the uh, information from your jaw. But you can, I, I showed you, you can use some pluses between the scan bodies or mark your uh, palate, I don't know, with a marker. So you have some distinct uh, features in the arc so you can have more uh, accurate scans in, from the dental patient. Great, for our colleagues, we do have a lecture regarding over dentures. Uh, Dr. Puya from Loma Linda will lecture regarding the over dentures, implant retain over dentures, so we can uh, listen to his lecture and get more information regarding uh, this type of processes. All right, Dr. Hassan Zadeh, thank you so much for your lecture and hopefully see you next year. Hope you to see you soon. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Asas.
نمیتونم با آقای ریمون صحبت کنیم It is at uh, tomorrow on uh, nine o'clock. Uh, nine, uh, yeah, nine to nine thirty, uh, I think. I don't have the schedule for tomorrow, but if it will be in tomorrow, uh, let me check out here. Like the Buya discussed the topic for uh over dentures implant retain over dentures so it's yeah. exactly and 9 a.m all right we move on with the next lecture uh dr olam reza shirani uh, um, oral and maxillofacial surgeon uh associate professor at department of oral and microfacial surgery school of dentistry tehran university of medical sciences uh, and dr shirani uh, the screen is yours uh. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. I'm glad uh, that you have invited me to this seminar. With the permission of the chairman and colleagues, uh, I will start my speech. The topic of my lecture is about superior implant surgery procedure. Uh, first, I will say an introduction about uh, the superior implant. Then uh, I will explain about the use of this implant uh, that uh, have been recently noticed. Uh, there are uh, different causes of bone uh, and uh, tooth loss, uh, which include congenital trauma, pathology, and most commonly routine tooth loss. Uh, the goals that uh, should be achieved after treatment of missing teeth and tooth defects and uh, bone defects include uh, facial aesthetic function, and uh, full rehabilitation of uh, mastication. Uh, various methods can be used to rehabilitate the masticatory system, which include uh, conventional prosthesis, uh, dental implants, zygomatic implants, uh, and, uh, and uh, 3D printed custom made superiostal implant, abbreviated SPI. Uh, one of the ways uh, to achieve rehabilitation, uh, uh, which can be said to be to be a but uh, an old and new method, uh, is superiostal implant. That's now uh, cortical uh, cortically supported uh, individu individual implants, and or patient specific implants, abbreviated PSI. Uh, so the first biocompatible alloy was uh, Vitalium, which was made in 1932. And the first time the, this uh, Vitalium SPI was designed and used by Dahl in uh, Sweden in uh, 1943. Uh, this is, I showed the design of the first SPI in early years. <clears throat> And uh, you see the evolution and variety of uh, SPI systems as designs in the following years. Uh, in the old way of this procedure, the surgery was performed in two stages. First, an incision was made on the crest of the ridge. Bone was exposed and the impression from bone was done. Then the incision was uh, sutured. After that, uh, the SPI was uh, designed and fabricated. After uh, preparing uh, 
uh, after preparing the SPI, the second stage of surgery was performed and SPI was uh, uh, placed on, uh, on the uh, bone. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, and the second surgery, uh, so, sorry, second surgery uh, uh, was performed and fabricated SPI was placed on the bone. So uh, you can uh, uh, see that is the, that it has long and uh, difficult steps in old methods, of course. So uh, uh, this method uh, had its own problems and complications in the past years. Uh, and uh, was abandoned for these reasons. Difficult to do it, uh, uh, do surgery, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, perform surgery twice, uh, low biocompatibility of uh, old alloys, uh, the possibility of loosening allergy and tissue reaction and uh, lack of uh, accuracy. Uh, with the advancement of technology in various fields of medicine, the use of the SPI uh, uh, has been noticed again. These developments are listed on uh, this slide, uh, development of uh, digital technology, use of accurate uh, 3D scans, using uh, accurate soft and hard tissue processing software, uh, improving biocompatibility of uh, tissue alloys, uh, in improvement of surgical methods and uh, patient preference uh, for less invasive surgery. Uh, this slide shows the composition of grade 23 titanium alloy, uh, which is used in making SPI. Uh, you can search for more uh, information about this alloy. And this alloy has good biocompatible properties that make it uh, suitable for the use in the human body. For example, uh, it has uh, a good corrosion resistance in, in sea water and marine environment, and uh, its resistance in chloride medium. So what are the advantages of uh, new subperiostal implants? No need for extensive uh, surgeries in another part of the body, for example, graft, fillet, and etc. Reduced surgical time, perfect alignment of the uh, superiostal implant uh, with the surgical site using accurate analysis by advanced software, ability to simultaneously restore aesthetic function and rehabilitation, precise symmetry on the heart tissue, and better patient acceptance. But this method, like any other methods, uh, also has disadvantages, uh, which are the surgeon must be experienced, the need to close relationship between surgeon and software specialist and prosthodontist uh, cannot be used in cases of uh, soft tissue uh, deficiency, uh, possibility of infection, dehiscence or wound opening and extensive, uh, expensive method. Well, I will show you a case uh, whom uh, superiostal implant method was used. Uh, you see the panoramic view of the patient. First, a normal implant uh, was used for him, which failed and the bone was resorbed and thinned. <clears throat> In total view, the mandibular ridge is short and thin. A 3D view of the patient. 
So after examination of the patient, the treatment plan uh, will be determined in cooperation with the prostodontist, Dr. Arshad. Then uh, suprarostal implant is designed as anatomical elements uh, are considered. Look at the inferior alveolar nerve canal and the mental foramen that's marked with arrows. The SBI is designed and you see the SBI that has made. And uh, I will briefly explain the procedure of surgery on the uh, slides. Uh, first, the incision is made on the crest of the ridge. You can see. Uh, because the jaws are usually atrophic, the dissection is done gently for two reasons. Firstly, in, max, in the maxilla, the sinus wall uh, is usually thin and there is a risk of sinus wall fracture and entering it. And secondly, in the mandible, due to alveolar resorption, the mental nerve becomes superficial and there is a possibility of uh, damage to, sorry, the damage uh, to the uh, mental nerve. You can see the mental nerve that uh, marked by arrows. And uh, if there is a need uh, for uh, bone reshaping in initial design, it's uh, determined from beginning. And uh, the guide is uh, prepared for it. And uh, you see a bone irregularity that needs to be reshaped. And by using the guide, the uh, bone reshaping is performed. Uh, then the SPI or superiostal implant is checked in its place. And uh, usually due to, to the high uh, uh, accuracy, To the high accuracy of modern SPI, it fits perfectly on the bone. Uh, then the uh, mental nerve is identified and marked by an arrows. After uh, making sure that uh, the SPI correctly uh, placed in its place is uh, fixed uh, by uh, uh, titanium screws, and fixing holes are already provided on the uh, superiostal implants. So, uh, sorry. <clears throat> Another piece of uh, subperiostal implant is uh, placed on the bone. And the second part of uh, subperiostal implant placed on the bone in its correct place with the help of the guide and adjacent uh, subperiostal implant. In this schematic view, you can see how to use the guide for uh, reshaping of bone. And uh, if everything is okay, the second part of the superiostal implant is also fixed to the, to the bone with screws. Uh, you see screws uh, by 
blue arrow and intact uh, mental nerve by yellow arrow. In this picture, you can see a small gap between bone and the uh, superiostal implant in some area. And uh, if the and the implant uh, are, the implants are covered by uh, bone material substitute and uh, uh, membranes for two purpose purposes. Uh, filling uh, small gaps between the bone and uh, the implant, and two, uh, increasing uh, the thickness of the soft tissue on the SPI and preventing on the uh, in, and preventing the wound uh, descent or wound opening. Uh, the soft tissue around the superiostal implant is slightly dissected and released, and then the, uh, it's sutured without any tension uh, with weak reel or nylon threads. Uh, this is another case. Uh, the patient uh, has severe bone loss. Uh, panoramic views taken by the patient before surgery. Uh, you see severe atrophy in maxillary and mandibular bones. Uh, the superiostal implant is made for the maxilla and uh, also mandible. Uh, see the maxillary bone with severe resorption and placement of the uh, superiostal implant on the maxilla. Uh, you can see that the incision and dissection are performed uh, and uh, the SPI is placed on the mandible. The mental nerve is preserved. You can see by marked arrow. Uh, finally, wand is sutured. And uh, the panoramic view was taken three months after surgery. Everything is okay and uh, it's ready to make a uh, prosthesis on it. And the last word, in order to get the best results of uh, the SPI uh, uh, surgery and reduce its complication, we should pay attention to this recommendation, to this uh, recommendation as uh, mentioned here. Focus on precise design before surgery, making a superiostal implant in several pieces, ensuring the exact uh, placement of the superiostal implant in its place, uh, the presence of uh, sufficient bone under the uh, superiostal implant in the places where it, the play, superiostal implant is fixed onto the bone, uh, sufficient contact between uh, uh, contact surface between bone and the superiostal implant, good soft tissue coverage, and a strict attention to the principles and uh, method of sterilization of the SPI. <laughs> And uh, if you have any questions due to the lack of time, of course, uh, with, with me, uh, for me, uh, I will be happy to answer your uh, email. This is my email. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shirani. It was very interesting. It was very informative. And I have a, a, by myself a question. May I ask it? Uh, um, Dr. Shirani, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shirani, uh, uh, I saw in your um, pictures uh, that um, vestibular, uh, especially at the lingual side, uh, was almost uh, eliminated. Uh, what do you do after surgery? Do you make a, a, a lingual vestibule for prosthesis or it is not necessary to do that? Of course, uh, we have another question. Oh, yeah. In uh, this, uh, in these uh, patients, uh, uh, it don't it doesn't need uh, to any uh, additional surgery, and that's uh, no that's not problem uh, for uh, vestibular uh, deep depth of vestibule. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, thank you so much. And um, um, uh, Dr. Mark have, uh, have uh, has asked, what about uh, also integration of SPI implants? Uh, I uh, uh, opened uh, after three to uh, four months uh, after surgery, uh, some new bones. Uh, um, Shape around the shape around the uh, this uh, these implants. Yes, yeah. I I uh, I hope <laughs> we we hope uh, uh, also integration uh, done after uh, around the these uh, uh, implants. Yes. Yeah, uh, Dr. Shirani, do you know why we are asking the question? Because we uh, have no chance to listen to your um, lecture anywhere else. So now we are asking, uh, we, uh, uh, I and Dr. Mokwali are classmates with Dr. Shirani. You know, you know. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, great. Great. <laughs> yeah. 20 now, years ago, maybe. Thank you. Or, or, <laughs> what, are you, what are you saying? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Regarding these implants, although we do have a next lecturer, Dr. Arshad, she's going to present regarding the prosthetic part. But uh, my question, if is there any preferences regarding the number of abutments you put on the SPI implants? Because I saw you have like eight abutments on the top of the uh, implants and on the maxillary arch, we did have like six abutments. How do you design it? Does it depends on the amount of bone or the patient? What's your preference? Uh, it's uh, difficult to uh, answer uh, uh, this <laughs> question because I don't know any uh, processes. Uh, uh, problems. The treatment part. Yes. All right. The superstructure, I would ask Dr. Arshad regarding this question. There is an, another question coming up regarding the survival rates of SPI implants since uh, there was a gap for the uh, subperiostal implants. In the beginning, most of the implants were subperiostal, but now recently they came up and for a specific patients, they are very useful. How is the survival rate for these type of uh, implants? Uh, in uh, some articles, uh, I found uh, that uh, the SPI survival implants in uh, 15 years. In 15 years, about, uh, uh, I think, uh, if uh, I remember it, uh, 50, 30 percent after, uh, uh, after 15 years, after 15 years uh, follow. Right. About 50, uh, 53, uh, 54, 53 percent uh, successful. Great. So for certain patients, that would be very helpful. The patient can't tolerate the bone uh, expansion or GBR or bone augmentation. So this type of treatment would be very helpful. Great. I don't see any other questions. So I would say thank you so much, Dr. Shirani. It was great you. having you here. And hopefully see you next year. You are welcome. Thank you. All right, we move on with the next lecturer, Dr. Arshad. Uh, she graduated in um, from Tehran University 15 years ago. Then she continued her advanced graduate student in prosthodontics and graduated 11 years ago. articles, and she's a full-time faculty of Tehran University School of Dentistry. Her topic for today is patient-specific subperiosal implants, uh, the prosthetic part. So we move on with the next lecture. Dr. Arshad, please go on. Is she on?
Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I am Dr. Mahna Zarshad, prosthodontist and uh, associate professor of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. I'm going to be speaking to you today about the saparosal implant, especially prosthodontics parts. صدای من دارین؟ خوب هست؟ هست؟ Yes, we do hear you. Please move on. So, okay. 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 Um, everybody knows about the implants. Today, goal of modern dentistry is restore normal contour and function, comfort, aesthetics. And, uh, you know, dental implants help us today uh, for these reasons and for these goals. But in, but in some special situation, when uh, we have an atrophic ridge or when the nerve is near the crest, uh, we can use as a usual endosol implants. So that's the ch challenging today uh, to restore these people and to help these people uh, and you know, in uh, before, in some years before, uh, uh, some subperistal implants is uh, 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 were used, but they don't. They didn't have any good um, results. And uh, today, I want to talk about that. Why they didn't have any good results, and what's the uh, what's the new things about superstar implants that we use today and have a good result? You know, we have three types of dental implants: transdosal implants, that's a very uh, early implants, superstar implants, and endosos implants. And today's usual implants that we use is endosol implants. But subperistal implants is some in some occasion, for example, in trauma, in cancer, in a patient with long-term edentulous um, jaw, that we haven't enough bone, uh, we can use subperistal implants. Uh, if we want to introduce the subperistal implants. Uh, uh, we must say that a suprasal dental implant is a framework that uh, uh, use the retention from around around the bone, not uh, not in the bone. And uh, uh, in some in uh, primary suprasal implants, it's uh, the material is chrome cobalt, and they uh, use the castable procedure. Uh, so uh, the shrinkage, the material, the, um, uh, the procedure is uh, somehow makes uh, some bad results. So we put away the suppressor implants. But nowadays, we have another method, the digital revolution and the 3D printing and the SLM and CAT CAM new processing software that we use. For example, we use modern digital software, uh, some special software, for example, Materialist 2, and we have a CT uh, and 3D CT or CBCT 3D. So we can have exact, we can have exact suprasol implant from titanium alloy 23. So the procedure is very precise and uh, we can rule out the problem that we have with suprasol implant before in the past. So in new generation suprasol implant, the survival rate is so higher and we can help the people that don't, 
have any sufficient um, uh, bone. Titanium grade 24, 23 is biocompatible. It's so biocompatible. And the ultimate story is uh, 920 megapascal. That is so good. And the uh, elasticity modulus is uh, near the bone and the fat strand is so good. So uh, the behavior of material is uh, special and good for the purpose of us. Uh, and the framework design, as you see in the picture, in previous suppressor implant, they directly on the alveolar crest. But in new suppressor implant that we use nowadays, they surrounded the bone and used the same feces and the buccal uh, external buccal oblique ridge. So the retention, the also integration is so high, the mobility is less and the fixation is so higher than the previous suppressor implant. So we have the better uh, result, very better, very, uh, a very uh, better result. Okay, if we don't have suppressor implants, if uh, in a in a how in a so uh, so many years that we don't use suppressor implants, uh, we use short implants for such patients, or we use zygomatic implants. We use onlay graft, or uh, uh, we use nerve repositioning methods, or we use alveolar distraction or sojournesis. All of these procedures uh, have some uh, limited survival rate, have some um, side effect. For example, short implants, when we use short implants, uh, the bone resorption, the cross bone resorption, the stability may be uh, questionable. And also uh, in some how patient with very, uh, uh, very bad ridge resorption, very severe, uh, rich resorption, we can't use short implant, also, we can uh, uh, also use short implant. Or zygomatic implants have, um, needs a very, um, um, uh, very great surgical procedure. And uh, the surgeon needs to be put the implants in a special site and the patient needs to have uh, some um, bone in some area. So we have some patients that they don't have any uh, sufficient bone in that area and they don't want to go under this heavy surgery. Online graft is another method, but the uh, resorption is, uh, is uh, the problem. And the successful uh, and several rate is questionable. Many plants in online graft, they, um, uh, they failed because of the bone resorption. Another way is nerve repositioning. And uh, this uh, method uh, for the uh, mandibular jaw is questionable too, because many patients have a, uh, anesthesia, paresthesia in the uh, lower jaw, and it's a problem for the patient. It's a great problem for the patient. And another way, alveolar distraction or surgeon, is that it's a very heavy procedure. We can control uh, the plan of occlusion very much, and it's so hard, especially it's a very hard way in an uh, old patient, and uh, especially um, uh, and uh, our uh, many of our patient is old in old age. So suppressor implant um, is another way that can take pl take place of this procedure, and uh, uh, I do this procedure about five years. So I can talk about the survival rate in a five years. But other like other article that other people that work in suppression implant and publish the particle article, they uh, said that's a successful method and the uh, uh, survival rate is 79%, 87%. And that's good. That's great. Uh, Suppressor implants have, have some clinical complications, such as infections, early and late implant exposure, bone resorptions, 
maybe absence of also interaction, fistulation, implant mobility, patient discomfort and implant failure, pressure necrosis, failure of many uh, suprastal implants like the other in endostal implants. And it's not a new thing. We have some failures in endostal implants. But uh, with the suprastal implants, we can help people that they can't have a thesis. They can't have any mastication with the uh, usual implants. And uh, they don't want to be undertaken the uh, large grafting procedure and using the iliac bone graft and something like this. So it's helpful for these people. Uh, manufacturing for subpersonal implants is uh, nowadays is pure digital. We use virtual modeling on CT data and uh, then making uh, the subpersonal implant with titanium grade 23 with uh, SLM devices, uh, with 3D, uh, uh, 3D printing methods and finishing polishing and then use the surgery with the, some special guides and uh, the prosthodontic procedure is also pure digital. So the mistake is um, came down. Uh, for framework, uh, we have a fully identical or partially identical patients. So we must uh, um, determine and um, make the framework uh, especially for that patient, especially um, suitable for, the, for that bone anatomy and the structure. Uh, if you see the picture in a framework design, we have one pieces or segmented framework design. For mandibular, it's better uh, it's be a two pieces and for maxillary two pieces too because the seating of the, uh, the framework is more easier when it's uh, two piece instead of one piece. In a framework we have the we have the wings that we uh, screw the suprastal instead of the whole of the wings. We have the basal loop framework and the arms and the post. And the post is the um, uh, place that we connected the crowns or bridge and prosthodontics to the suprastal implants. Uh, the overall structure of the suprastal implants must be 1.5 up to 1.8 millimeter thick, and uh, not more uh, 1.2 or 5.3 more thicker because if it's so thick the dehiscence is be uh, uh, is uh, make me the dehiscence uh, we see the more de dehiscence so it's important that we uh, we make the suprasal implant in a very thin uh, shape and the wings uh, nowadays the suprasal implants have a shoulder uh, have a uh, shorter wings with two holes. One hose is uh, sufficient and another hose is the backup of the first hose if uh, the threads um, have a problem. And uh, uh, you see the arm is a very uh, um, sensitive part that you uh, maybe have the stress in it and uh, maybe you have the broke down. So when we design the suprastal implant, it's important that we straighten these parts. And the base of framework design is up to the bone. It consists of loops. Uh, it uh, consists of loops because if you want to separate uh, the, uh, the uh, one segment of subperson implant is more easier that you can uh, separate it. And uh, some special uh, uh, some special place that the surgeon can screw the subperson implant in the bone. And uh, after uh, uh, after we make the suprastal implant, 
polishing the permacosal extension is so important because if you have any dehiscence in this area, it must be polished um, very well because the uh, uh, it uh, because the plaque we don't uh, want to the plaque attached to this area, and uh, uh, and the patient can clean it uh, this area so easily. And we have different kind of posts, different model of posts, and I show you the different model that you can choose in um, uh, in the, your patient that what kind of this uh, uh, abutment or, your, or, or what kind of these posts you can select. Uh, in a ma manufacturer, the suppressor implants uh, were made with additive manufacturing uh, and, and the method is SLM because it's metals and EBM, DMLS, SLM, three different methods that they uh, make uh, suppressor implants, but SLM, that, uh, that's one uh, that we use in it in Iran. And uh, this is the device uh, that we use to make the suppressor implants. The material is titanium grade 23, and it's have high strength, to weight ratio, perfect fatty behavior, and outstanding corrosion resistance and biocompatible. Um, it must have complex geometry, process structure, and um, it must be cost efficient in small quantities and uh, variant mechanical properties and high accuracy up to 13 micrometer. For the procedure, at first, surgeon requests uh, the patient to go and uh, take the CT scan. So we see and check that it doesn't have enough uh, bone. And uh, then we make a surgical ascent and then the patient take the 3D CBCD or TRD CT and then we uh, design the suppressor implant up to the patient gel or patient uh, pathosis. Uh, and then after the person and surgeon, and surgeon approve the design, it's printed. And some surgery guide maybe uh, they make some surgery guard to put the printed uh, suppressor implant. And then, uh, we um, take scans of that, then go to the cleaning room, and then the patient under uh, was uh, under surgery. And after three uh, after surgery, after three weeks, uh, three weeks after surgery, we can deliver the temporary Quran. And after three months, we can deliver the final prosthesis. Uh, the sterilization of suppressor implant uh, is uh, with gamma or article of B or ethylene oxide. For, um, for prosthetic design of the suppressor implant, we have four ball design, connecting bar, connection design, and abutment level. Ball design is the primary feature of suppressor implant. And uh, we have some problem with this kind of feature because the roughness of the ball, because uh, 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 the ball made with the casting procedure and the wear of the balls after somehow the patient use it, uh, the wear of the ball make the retention so decrease. And the paralysis of the ball is, is another thing that must be so important, cap retention and the dimensional accuracy because when we printed the ball after the printing procedure, the sample lasted and the polishing. So the ball, so this procedure make the ball so smaller and we don't have the exact size. So the retention is the problem. You see the patient that uh, we use the ball in this patient, 
the patient come to our office with the uh, mandibular breakdown, left mandibular breakdown because of the severe atrophic ridge. And we design the suprostal implants with the ball type shape uh, and uh, the ball type for the retention of the prosthesis and the structure for the stabilizing, stabilizing the broken uh, jaw. And you see it's a um, kind of overdenture that we make for her, but the retention of the ball after three years is the problem for us because some ball is uh, uh, weird. So the cap is not suitable for that. Because of that, I don't like so much the ball type of the uh, subperusal implants. Another uh, category of the uh, prosthodontics features of the connecting bar. Momart, Mr. Momart, and uh, the one the, uh, that uh, do the suprasal implants so much that likes the connecting bar. And you see in the picture how he used it. He put the suprasal implants and uh, some pose, and after that, they make the bar and uh, they deliver the prosthesis as a screw uh, retained prosthesis. Um, something like the hybrid, hybrid prosthesis. Another model is connection design that they make the uh, connection of the implants in the post of the suprasal implants and uh, use some um, impression coping and abutment like the endosol abutment implants for them. But the so important thing that you must pay attention on it is uh, for the length of the connection, you need to have some uh, height of the post. And in somehow uh, we don't, Mm, we can't use it because the post came out of the uh, mucosal and it makes the, mm, uh, it's not satisfied the patient. That you, when you see, you have the, some uh, grayish uh, metal on his mouth. And also the connection must be very precise. And the, and the, uh, and the about one is, um, can connect it uh, to its very, very, uh, very fit. So it's another problem. The last uh, design, it's my design, is Abatman level suprasol implants. I like it so much. It's so hard to design it because you must um, design the abutment before the patient go to the surgery room. So everything must be exact. Uh, because after that, you can change the degree of or length of the abutment. So you must see the end stage of the prothesis in the first stage. But if you do it uh, in a very exact way, uh, instead it's hard, but at the end, I think it's better. It's, uh, it's more easier. I can show some patient to you that uh, you see my design partial edentulis that you see in this patient. In this patient, we have class one Kennedy. We don't have any twos. Excuse me. We don't have any twos, both side of distal extension of the jaw. And you see the nerve is up to near the uh, crest and the patient don't want to have any anesthesia or paresthesia. Uh, don't accept, didn't accept any risk of the paresthesia of the nerve because of their nerve repositioning. So we decided to uh, did the, uh, uh, to make the suprasal implants for her. We make some uh, surgical stent, special surgical stent, and take some CT. Uh, 3D CT. So we designed the suprasal implants for hair, as you see. And you see, in for suprasal implants, at least you need 0 0.8 millimeter of cord carbon. So we can do it for many patients. 
and you see the uh, suprasol implants that's ready. The patient go to the surgery room and do the surgery, the surgery, and you see the suprasol implants in his in her mouth. And after that, we uh, prepare and make the prosthodontics, and you see the patient is have three years follow up, and you see the radiographic of the patient, and it's good. Uh, we satisfy of the result of this patient. This is another patient, and the man have the uh, uh, Edentulus Kennedy class two. And uh, you see, it's uh, we have a resorption of the jaw so much, so we can't put in the sole implants without any paresthesia or anesthesia of the uh, jaw. So we uh, decide to put the supra sole implants so we make some uh, surgical ascent. We put the sulfide barium just on teeth, not on the base, because we want to have the crystal crest of the base on the CT. And we design the subperisol implants uh, upon of the surgical instant, uh, surgical ascent that you see in the picture. And that uh, after that, we printed the pre implant and we do the surgery and we deliver the prosthesis. It's have a one year follow up and follow up and it's good. We have the good result. Another case is full mouth edentulus. And you see the patient that have the some had the some previously had the some endosol implants and he, uh, then implants was failed and he lose, lost all of his uh, bones and he just he was just 25 years old. He's so depressed because he haven't hadn't any teeth. So we decided to uh, make the subparasol implants for him. You see the 3D cities uh, of him. We designed the suppressor implants in two parts for a maxilla. Abutments depends on the surgical extent. As you see in, a, in this uh, schematics view of his uh, jaw, the suppressor implant, the extents, the lateral view. And after that, we printed the implants. You see the polished surface, the sandblasted surface, uh, of the subparacel implants. Uh, the temporary also, also we make the temporary before he came to the uh, surgery room. After he went to the surgery room, uh, the subparacel implant was screwed in the uh, on the maxilla and you see the healing of the uh, implants, just we have uh, one, Side the hisense in a right uh, maxillary is not so important. You see the pose, the abutments, and we deliver the. Uh, we also deliver the temporary for three months. It's the sitting is so good, so easy. And after three months, we check the uh, framework. We didn't. Um, take um, any impression because we have the files before he gone, he went to the impression uh, surgery room. And you saw the, you see the final processes and that is the smile view of the patient after we deliver the prosthesis. We have the five year follow of this patient and it's good just uh, the rights of the, the sense of the rights of, of the maxillary and uh, that's not important for this patient. We check it. You see the radiography of the primary phase, temporary phase, and the final restoration. This is another full mouth reconstruction case that you see. We have the patient, fully identical patient, with a very resorb. Uh, reach and uh, uh, the patient is so depressed because he just 28 years uh, he was 28 years old 
and he wants to have a statics also have a mastication. So we make the surgical stand, we catch the 3D CT, and uh, we design the structure, the superstall implants uh, upon the uh, surgical stand, and they were printed the mm, the printed the superstall implants. We uh, the, uh, we put it in the surgery room, and. This is the final result of the patient. You see, we have some dehiscence in the lower and upper jaw, but the dehiscence is in uh, polished permacusal area. So it's okay. Okay. In a very uh, uh, large upper soul implants, we must be maybe have uh, some dehiscence. But when the, uh, when, um, the dehiscence is in polished area, the patient can um, clean it and uh, it's, uh, uh, the maintenance is not so hard. This is another full mouth reconstruction patient, just the, for the mandibular reconstruction. The patient came to our office from Canada, the, the, the woman about 67 years old, and you see uh, the resorb uh, mandibular gel. We make the stent uh, and catch the um, 3D CT, design the suppressor implants, and also change the upper gel crown. And you see the final result of hair, just two sides of the uh, the sense you see in a lower jaw, but the radiography when you see it's good. This is the picture of the patient, the pre-treatment and after treatment picture. And this uh, suppressor implant is so useful and so special in tumor excision patients. And uh, I put the two case uh, of tumor excision. The first case is the man about 48 years old and he uh, catched, caught the amyloblastoma tumor in the uh, right side of the mandible. And the many uh, doctors said to him, and you must section your jaw and your face is uh, is a change and after that you can go and rehabilitate or reconstruct with some plate and put some removable uh, prosthesis. But when he came to our office, we offer him suppressal implants and we designed the suppressal implants up to his uh, 3D CT. Uh, You, have, you see the CT of the patient with the uh, severe amyloblastoma, and you see the exoda on the intraoral uh, photo. We section the uh, jaw up to how we want to section the jaw in a surgery room, and then we design the plate and also the abutments as a suppressor implants. And we, and we designed the abutment up to, up to the teeth that uh, he had uh, in his mouth. And after that, we print that abutment and make the temporary crown before he went to the surgery. After the surgery, we delivered the temporary crown. And after three months, the patient came, we say model, we checked the modeling wax, printed modeling uh, wax, and then we deliver the final processes to the patient. We have the three years follow up of this patient, and it's good. Another patient is a patient of the amylose, of a history of amyloblastoma, but he he was surgery um, so two years ago, 
and uh, he came to our office with uh, with this shape of his uh, jaw and he and she uh, wasn't satisfied with the appearance and she was also have uh, she also had she also wanted uh, the aesthetics and the masticatory uh, uh, solution of his mouth so we designed the suppression impact we make some uh, surgical ascent and take you know, she take the 3D CT and we done we designed the subparasol implants and the, with the subparasol implants we tried to make the chin correct corrected but uh, something is important that it's uh, because of the uh, scar of the tissue we can't protrude uh, the suprasol implants so much because it's made some dehiscence there. So we delivered the suprasol implants as you see, and we uh, checked the uh, modeling resin and then delivered the final restoration. And this is the satisfaction of the patients. We corrected the chin, but uh, the correction more of the chin maybe uh, with some prosthesis, not with the suprasol implants, but uh, but uh, she could uh, masticate uh, with these uh, prosthesis. So she's satisfied. I delivered this patient before the Nowruz uh, holiday, the last day of the span, and she uh, was so happy and so thankful, and it's. Uh, it's um, the great time of my. I uh, have the movie of uh, how making suppressor implants. Um, maybe you uh, want to see these. This is of the patient, the man that have an amyloblastoma. This is the procedure of the surgery and putting and screen the suppressor implants. Uh, I want to thank you to everybody that hear me. Thank you so much, Dr. Arshad. It was great, quite very yes, and, uh, amazing. Them. Thank you very much. Thank you too. All right, Dr. Arshad. Thanks a lot for the wonderful presentation. I'm sure that uh, we have a lot of questions here. Uh, uh, let me start by myself and then we see who has question. As far as the number of abutments in different situations and the height of the abutments, what are your preferences and how do you recommend that? Uh, the height and the number of the abutments is just like the endostal implants. And I designed the abutments like um, the situation that I have the endostal implants. Um, the abutments is any extension and the abutments in a key points, for example, in the molar side, in the canine side, in the first central and the first premolar size. But the point, the key point of the abutment is it's not, uh, they're not, they, they aren't, uh, they aren't being so near because it makes so dehiscence. At least we must have six millimeter distance between one abutment to other. And the six or seven millimeter distance be between abutment and the bone, um, especially in a, 
uh, tumor excision, in a tumor excision, uh, um, you must put the seven, six millimeter distance between the uh, level of the abutment and the bone because the abutment is so deeper than the crystal bone. And uh, if we don't have pay attention to these, uh, after the surgery, we can in we can't insert the prosthesis. So uh, uh, we must pay attention on the distance of the abutment and the height. Uh, because in this way, for example, in very resorbed um, uh, crystal bone or in excision or in uh, tumor excision, we have very long abutment. I uh, don't uh, make the abutment longer than 11 millimeter because many lung abutment make the insertion of the prosthesis so hard. So uh, these key points is uh, not written or not written anyway. It's uh, our experiment in, uh, for example, in I think 35 patients. Maybe uh, we can uh, publish it uh, in uh, uh, in uh, in uh, next years if the patient come more, and for example, we can publish the review of some patient and publish the result, and other uh, scientists have um, some um, their uh, give us their opinion about these things. But uh, the experiment of me is that. Great. So we are looking forward to have more uh, articles from you in international. Uh, Thank you very much. Journals. So another question regarding you mentioned uh, at one point, we do have titanium and corm cobalt part. Is it in one piece of periosteal implants or it, it comes uh, in, it depends on the patient or situation. Could you excuse hear me? me? No, excuse me, could you please repeat? I don't have your voice. Okay. Could you please repeat the question? I think you will stop. Pause the moderator was. Sorry, we, it seems that okay. uh, we lost the connection for a second. So uh, <laughs> if you don't mind, would, pardon me. No. Could you answer the question? We had the lost connection could please, here. Uh, uh, could you please re uh, repeat it? I can't hear. Could you please repeat the question? Uh, Dr. Asha, can you hear me? Yes, now, yes. All right, so there's a, another question coming up regarding the software that you use to design the framework. Okay. Okay. Go on, please. Okay, One of I audience, yeah, Uria okay. asked the software. Okay, uh, I didn't hear very well. You asked me about your software that right, we that's design. Correct. Yes, we use materials too for designing the suprasol implant. That's uh, some engineering software for designing. Great. And then another question is regarding the immediate loading. I saw for the most of the cases, uh, you had this option to deliver a provisional restoration for the patients at the day of the surgery. 
which is very great. And you satisfy the patient with the result from the very beginning. So uh, is it very common? Do you usually uh, prefabricate the provisional restorations at the, uh, at the stage of uh, framework design and it's ready to deliver at the day of surgery? Yes, uh, you know, in the abutment level design, because we have some long abutments, some abutments in the patient mouth, if we don't deliver uh, the temporary, it's uh, annoying the patient. The abutment maybe uh, have to make some discomfortation for patient. So we have an option to deliver uh, after three weeks. We deliver the temporary crown, maybe some patient didn't want or didn't accept, but uh, in most patients we deliver and it's so good because uh, they came back, especially in a tumor exition, they came back to the routine uh, life after, uh, the day after surgery and they are so satisfied because in tumor exition, they think after the surgery, they miss their appearance, their ability, and uh, their jaw is uh, so uh, canted, so canting. So if uh, we deliver the temporary crown, they came back to their uh, normal life easily and uh, uh, rapidly. So have a very good psychological effect and also physiological effects for, because they can eat. It's easily, and uh, if we don't deliver the temporary, the the tongue exam, especially the tongue is um, some annoyable. It's uh, they are not comfortable with the tongue and the abutment. Right, right. Yeah, that's obvious. That because the abutments are very sharp and long, so it bothered the patient and. Um, it does help the patient for chewing as well as protecting the tongue. So yeah. uh, it was a very nice topic uh, since I'm prosthodontist too. So I would like to ask a question regarding the uh, fully edentulous patients that you provide uh, processes for them. Uh, and you mentioned that you made the processes ready ahead of time. So regarding that cases, did you have any issue regarding the uh, occlusal plan and the lip support? How do you design that uh, critical points for that patient? Okay, uh, for the edentulous patient, we do we did we do all the thing in a first stage before the surgery. If we make the uh, surgical SNS, we make the, them, we make for them the complete denture. We analyze and determine the lip support, the occlusal plan, and after that, we uh, we prepare the teeth and we check it in the patient mouth, and then we make the surgical SNS. But the special point of the suprasol implant is the uh, abutment must on the crystal bone, not very far from the crystal bone. So as you see, for example, in my patient in a man, so the complete edentulous patient, we can't uh, make the profile, uh, we can't bring the profile so forward. Because if we forward the suprasol implant, it makes some distance. Maybe in some occasion, the overdenture had a so better aesthetic appearance, but many patients didn't want, don't want the overdenture. They want the fixed prosthesis as they are so young. So uh, that the point we must pay attention on the suprasol implant is we can't, uh, make the profile so uh, forward. We can't uh, we can't correct the uh, profile so more. Just for example, for 
five millimeter, six millimeter, we can uh, compromise the profile, but not, a, not so much. So every patient come to my office, I said to him, if you want to correct your uh, lip uh, profile or your uh, nasal labial line, we can do the suppressal implants. You must go and put the, for example, four implants and do as an overdenture. Uh, that is, but uh, before the surgery, before we make the surgical stand, uh, we determine the lip line, the occlusal plan as we can do and show the patient and patient uh, said okay to us and after that we make the surgical stand you know, and he put the stent and take the 3d ct and then with that ct and the position of the teeth the engineer designed the you know, abutment pose and so we have the occlusal plan the lip line the profile and uh, and the implant also the implant so just we must um, make some uh, small correction in a um, definitive process great so as far as my understanding as you mentioned you provide uh, a full denture for a fully dentures patient and that would be your reference point for lip support and the vertical dimension of the jaws, and you duplicate that uh, denture for the definitive restoration. Great. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Dr. Farid, do you have I any have questions? Some questions, but I will ask you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Now we are in the break time. Uh, Thank thanks a lot, Dr. Arshad. We are very really grateful for having you here with these wonderful cases. And it's my pleasure to, to explain. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. All right, we are moving on to the next session. Uh, next lecture is Dr. Atri. She's Associate Professor of Department of Prosthodontics, School of Dentistry, Tehran University Medical Science. Her topic for today is digital workflow for immediate loading. And she's on air, please move on. Hello, Dr. Sadakhu. Thank you. Uh, I'm ready to start. Please carry on. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello, everyone. In this lecture, it's my pleasure to be here in this valuable digital course. As Dr. Sadakh will introduce me, I'm Dr. Faiz Antri, uh, and I'm going to speak about digital workflow for immediate loading. As you know, tooth loss may occur due to caries, periodontal disease, trauma, and it's a uh, a uh, bad uh, event that people are seeking for replacement of their teeth. And nowadays, you know that the best replacement of missing teeth is to have dental implants. In conventional approach, we uh, have a surgery section that we place the fixture inside the jaw. And uh, conventionally, we wait for three to four months to implant become healed. And after that, it's ready for the processes. But today, according to this uh, demand of aesthetic all over the world, patients do not accept to uh, have a period of agent loss in their life. And they want to have uh, tooth always, and they seek for provisional restoration during this time. 
We have two kinds of provisional illustration in implant prosthodontics. The first version is the traditional one, non-implant supported provisional restriction. And the other one is implant supported provisional restriction, which is uh, better. Uh, I start with the features of an ideal provisional restriction. We know that the provisional restriction may be used for a period of time, about uh, three to six months, and it should be strong, durable, have a good aesthetic and appearance, and uh, so important, it should do not exert any pressure to the underlying tissue, which is the fixture part or graft uh, part that uh, we are waiting for healing. The non-implant support provisional restriction, which are the traditional uh, provisional restriction we had, most of the time are uh, tissue-borne removable restrictions. As you can see here, uh, they have a tissue support and they can replace just missing teeth. Uh, they are in low cost and it's easy to make, but uh, there is lots of problem with these kind of uh, restrictions. The main disadvantages are their bulkiness in the patient mouse, the palatal coverage that is uh, inconvenient for patients to uh, speak and to swallow. Uh, also, its removable nature is not okay for patient and patients are not satisfied with this kind of restrictions. Uh, sometimes this restriction can lead to soft tissue inflammation and they have potential of exerting pressure to the underlying surgical uh, place. And if any micro movement happen in the fixture side, it may lead to fibrous encapsulation. And so it means that the implant is failed. So it's not a good option in all the cases. The better option is implant supported provisional restriction. Means we put a uh, temporary restriction that is fixed to the fixtures and it has good uh, features. The main advantage of this uh, processes is psychological benefits that patients are happy. They feel that it's their aunties and they are not um, unpleased with it. The patient can have oral function and aesthetic together. It's more convenient for the patient. And we can have control over the amount of soft tissue pressure exerted. Uh, the provisional restriction is a template for the definitive restriction, and it's no interruption to healing process of implant and graft side. And also, we can use uh, the provisional restriction as an evaluation for future definitive restriction, which be in harmony with surrounding structures, and we can detect if any hard and tissue and soft tissue deficiency is uh, present or not, or if we want to plan for uh, more surgery. And one of the most important advantages of this um, provisional restoration is that we can form the tissue and we can contour the emergence profile during the uh, healing process. And after that, we can transfer this mature soft tissue to definitive process. So immediate loading in term means that we allow the patient occlusal forces to be loaded on implants immediately after the surgery up to two weeks. But in some texts, uh, they, uh, uh, say that we should load up to two days, not two weeks. Two weeks is really high, but it's okay to have uh, the immediate, thing, uh, immediate loading up to two days. And whenever possible, we want to 
uh, have the restoration out of occlusion because we want not to patient uh, load the implant in a, an uncontrolled way. But when it is not possible, for example, when we are rehabilitating a uh, jaw, means full arch rehabilitation, and edentulous mandible or maxilla, we should have occlusion and we should adjust the occlusion in order to distribute the uh, load all over the implants. And if we have in one or uh, multi-unit uh, restoration, we prefer to just have immediate restoration. Means it can be for the purpose of aesthetic, but it's out of occlusion to control the loading. For immediate loading, it's very important to have the primary stability. And uh, we can say that primary stability is the key prerequisite for immediate loading. During the surgery, the surgeon should evaluate it and uh, there is some um, techniques. For example, we should uh, have a torque value uh, ranging from 30 to 35 Newton centimeter and higher. It's the threshold for immediate loading in torque value less than this amount. We cannot do immediate loading. Also, we can check the uh, resonance frequency analysis by Astel device and the ISQ uh, must be more than 45 for immediate loading and for delayed loading, it's uh, good to be more than 60. And we can use prior test, which is a test to uh, evaluate the mobility of tooth or fixtures. Uh, it can be ranged between minus 80 to uh, positive 15 for good primary stability that allow us to do immediate loading. It should be uh, less than zero. Uh, there are some indications for immediate loading. We can do immediate loading for patients with good general health. Uh, they should have adequate bone quality and quantity. Uh, there should not be any acute infection and we should achieve to a good primary stability of implants. And also uh, we should ability to achieve an adequate anterior posterior spread between the implants. It's important for full arch reconstructions. But the contraindication for immediate loading is really high and uh, patient with poor systemic health or metabolic disease, patient with severe parafunctional habits such as praxis or tantras are not the case for immediate loading and reports shows that um, most of the failure occurred in these patients. Heavy cigarette smoking, inadequate bone volume, and very poor bone density, for example, D4 bone, are not uh, appropriate for immediate loading. Uh, infection or periodontal disease, the problem of immunodeficiency, head and neck radiotherapy, alcohol or drug abuse, and pregnancy are not the case for immediate, immediate loading. And one of the most important is the of cooperation of the patient. If the patient is not uh, cooperative, uh, we cannot do immediate loading. And immediate loading is a teamwork which we need to be in close relation with surgical team and restorative team and patient together. And we should do it in a single visit or uh, up to one or two days after implant placement. Okay, uh, let's see about the literature, what they say about the success and survival of immediate loading. I uh, bring some uh, review articles, some recent, uh, 2016 uh, meta-analysis review article shows that there is no statistically significant difference between immediate and uh, delayed loading uh, regard to implant survival. And there is no difference between marginal bone loss and they report the uh, immediate loading as a successful protocol. 
In 2017, we had another meta-analysis review article that shows the same, that the success and stability of immediate loading implant is same as the uh, delayed loading. And it's uh, interesting that marginal bone loss in immediate loading was less than conventional technique. The other article, 2019, shows that uh, the protocol of immediate loading uh, have no difference with uh, delayed loading in terms of bone loss and probing depth and success rate. Another article 2021 uh, shows that the pink aesthetic score and the uh, buccal plate thickness in immediate implants are more improved, improved than delayed load implant and it's better in aesthetic region. And the last Article that I have is 2022 that shows that we have a high success rate in immediate uh, load implants. There are low numbers of biologic and hardware complications, and people are more satisfied with these aesthetics. Let's see the conventional method of uh, immediate loading, and then we are going to explain about the digital method. Conventional method needs diagnostic wax up or setup in advance. Then we should use temporary cylinder to uh, attach the uh, provisional restriction. And it takes more chair time as is affordable. Uh, it's like that you want to uh, find a topic between uh, the books in a large library with lots of books and it's really hard to do it. Let's see a case of uh, conventional immediate loading. This patient have, uh, has two um, hopeless incisor central teeth, which should be extracted. Before the procedure, we should take a primary impression and do the wax up for it. After that, in the surgery session, when the implants are inserted, we use the temporary cylinder and we adapt a layer of composite to this uh, temporary cylinder and we transfer it to the patient mouse. After tightening the screw of this temporary cylinder, we should adjust the height of it according to the space and the occlusion, as you can see here. And after that, we use an index for uh, transferring the outer contour of the teeth to the mouse. And we um, get light cure in order to uh, the temporary material being set. After the setting, we perforate the screw access and remove the temporary restriction. As you can see here, the outer contour is okay, but we should uh, mold the gingival part ourselves freehand and we add composite in this side. We plan to uh, have a good emergence profile, a gradual transition from the neck of the implant to the coronal part. And it's so important to have it in polished uh, and a high glossy surface in order not to be um, plaque retentive. And after that, it's ready to transfer to the patient mouse. It's a screw inside. The screw access is covered with a Teflon and then it's filled with compost. And we have this crown inside. It is a good result, but it's time uh, consuming and it's a little, a little difficult for everyone to do in this uh, manner especially when we are uh, in immediate loading process, immediately after the surgery, we have uh, blood and the isolation is really difficult. We have the conventional procedure of um, full mouse, uh, full arch here, in full arch um, restoration, uh, we had a denture, we put the implants inside and we uh, screwed the temporary cylinder 
on the implants. And after that, we drilled from the denture to have a space for uh, the implants inside. And after that, we use self-cure composite to attach the temporary cylinder to dental um, surface of the processes. After that, we should remove the processes and we should cut the cantilever sections. We should cut the flange and uh, form this uh, denture as a fixed processes in order to be cleansable for the patient. And after that, we should check the occlusion in the mouse to be in a good uh, distribution of load inside the patient mouse. And as you see, it was um, a difficult process which needs more chair time. But the digital immediate loading uh, is really better than the conventional. Uh, we need to have virtual planning inside the software and it can be more accurate and it can be time saving. If I want to compare it to conventional method, it's like that you want to search a topic in the digital library. You can just write it and with one click in your laptop or tablet or cell phone, everywhere you can find your topics. Let's see the uh, digital workflow here. We have some treatment phase and procedures. In diagnostic phase, we should do intraoral scans to have the picture of the mouse inside the software. And then we should have Conbin computer tomography scan, means the CBCT. And in, in the software, we should superimpose and merge these two together to have a digital setup. In planning phase, we should plan for a digitally prosthetically uh, driven implant position. We should plan according to next processes, and then we can manufacture the surgical template, and then we can manufacture the computer-aided uh, design and milling of the temporary restoration. It can be shell restoration or the whole restoration. I'm going to explain in next slides. In the surgical session, uh, most of the time, we can do flapless aesthetic computer assistant immediate implant surgery. And after that, in restorative phase, we should um, deliver the um, provisional restoration to patients. Let's see uh, about the digital surgical guide. My dear colleague, Dr. Uh, Mohajeri, uh, will explain about digital surgical guides, but I mentioned just some advantage of this because we can have a visual potential implant size in 3D in relation to the processes, and it helps us to uh, place the implant in precise location, it has less risk of compromising adjacent vital structure. And uh, by surgical guide, we are enabled to do flapless surgery. And after that, in this method, we have CAT CAM provisional restoration. Uh, as you know, the CAT CAM material are high density polymers and they are high cross link PMMA. They have favorable uh, mechanical behaviors and biocompatibility. Uh, we can use this kind of provisional material for an extended time period. And also we can uh, reshape, add or repolish this restoration uh, in the office. It's really easy to work with them. We have the ability to design and modify the pontic morphology digitally to accumulate for the uh, changes in soft tissue architecture through the treatment. I mean that we can do tissue molding easily in this technique and it's easy re replacement of a fracture prosthesis or the cemented prosthesis, even sometimes patients lost their prosthesis when we have the design in software, we, we just uh, have an order to 
milled it again and delivered to the patient. And it's cost effective alternative to these laboratory manufacturer uh, processes that are not as good as these digitals. Um, in this slide, uh, we are going to see about the single unit or multi unit uh, restorations that we uh, plan to be out of occlusion and are not going to be uh, directly. Uh, loaded in centric relation. In this case, you can see a hopeless um, central incisor that should be extracted. We have a intraoral scan and we have a CBCT of patient and we superimpose these two together in the software and we can uh, design a surgical template. After that, the surgical template is milled with milling machine. And in the same session, we have the temporary restoration. This temporary restoration is shell provisional restoration, means that it is hollow. And it has some wings that help us to uh, sit it in the mouth of the patient. In the clinical session, the tooth is extracted in an automatic procedure and after that the implant is inserted uh, through the digital uh, surgical guide. After that we have temporary abutment inside and we use this uh, provisional restriction. But by these uh, wings we can locate it in the appropriate place and after that we should use self-care acrylic to um, attach this shell to the uh, temporary abutment. Uh, it can be a little uh, time assuming, but uh, it can com compensate any uh, movement in surgical procedure. And so after that, we have a polished surface and good and uh, proper contour restoration in the patient mouse. And patient is really happy that uh, he or she is going to home with this uh, provisional. We can have this uh, technique for full arch immediate loading rehabilitation. Again, means this shell restoration in full arch uh, loading. Here is the case. We have uh, an agent loose patient. First of all, we sent patient to get CBCT. And because it's a uh, full mouse, we have some radiographic markers and maybe radiographic teeth as a, a guide for planning. And we can do the planning inside the software according to the location of um, future teeth. And in these uh, templates, we have some fixing pins which uh, fix the uh, template to the jaw in order not to be moved laterally or anterior posterior. And so according to this, the template uh, is designed completely. We send it to milling machine and you can see here the template of uh, implant insertion. After that, we can uh, design for a restoration, provisional restoration according to the placement of the implants. And for more uh, precision, there is some fixing pin in the provisional restriction again. In the surgery session, the surgical guide is uh, fixed with help of the occlusion and through this fixing pin. And after that, the surgery can be uh, performed exactly from this guide, you can see that the fixture R is inserted. After that, we remove the surgical templates and we screw the uh, meso abutment on the fixtures and we can put the um, temporary cylinder here. And then we have the uh, restoration which can be fixed with this pin to 
jaw and there is a space between the cilantro and the teeth that we can uh, fill it with self-cure acrylic. It's uh, a little uh, affordable, but it's okay because any inaccuracy in surgical uh, process can be compensated through this uh, acrylic uh, filling gap in this session. And after that, we should adjust the occlusion in order to have the most distribution of loads inside into the arcs. Um, I'm going to introduce another way to do immediate loading. Uh, it's uh, from uh, the beginning, we can have intraoral scan or we can have conventional impression and do laboratory scan and we have CBCT. We superimpose this data together in software and we plan for the location of implants according to the future processes. And we uh, have a surgical templates. After that, we can have the customized abutment and restoration together in order to uh, be uh, more convenient in the uh, uh, clinical session. We can plan customized abutment in a good contour. As you can see here, we have two contours in abutments. The first one is critical contour, which is the contour exactly uh, in the one millimeter below the gingival margin. And the second contour is subcritical contour, which is lower than critical contour. When we properly manage these two contours, we have uh, a good soft tissue volume and we can have the papilla inside and good emergence profile for the next restoration. In this picture, you can see customized abutment with uh, design of gingival part for central incisor, for premolar and for molar according to the tools, we can design the appropriate contour. And after that, we can have the uh, cat cap provisional restriction on these uh, customized abutments. It's ready for delivering. It's no need for uh, adding uh, resin acrylic to fill the gaps and it's more convenient. Some of them are totally cemented. Some of them can be uh, cemented screw or perforated to uh, have the access to the implant channels, uh, screw channels. You can see here a case of single unit immediate loading. It's a lateral iron incisor. During the surgery, we insert the customized abutment inside. You can see here and the palatal view and the uh, uh, immediate restoration is in place. After healing, you can see the architecture of the gingiva and the papilla here, and it's really okay for definitive restoration. Again, here we have a case of single uh, central that uh, it's immediately loaded. It's under occlusion uh, intentionally in order to control the load. And as you can see, we have molding the tissue. We have papilla in mesial and distal side. We have the architecture. And you can see here from the frontal and occlusal view, the room for definitive restoration. And so the definitive restoration is in um, harmony with other teeth. And it's not really um, easy to uh, determine which one is the implant because it's really nice in pink and white aesthetic scope. It's another case of multi-unit uh, immediate loading. After the insertion of implant, we screwed the abutments and the uh, provisional restriction is delivered, as you can see here. And my last case is a full mouse rehabilitation of uh, immediate loading, a patient with hopeless teeth in maxillary, and a denture in mandibular seeking for getting fixed uh, restoration on both jaws. First of all, we uh, make an impression out of maxillary and mandibular jaw. And after that, we ordered for a record base and back stream. 
which uh, there is, there are some uh, radio pack markers inside it. And we did the job relation means the CR and VD of patient is determined. And with this uh, record based patient sent to uh, CT scan, you can see the CT scan, the white uh, radio pack markers can be seen here and here. And we did the planning inside to software. In the surgery session, the upper and lower surgical guides are inserted and they are fixed through these anchorage pins and the implants are inserted. And immediately after that, we insert the abutments and the uh, prosthesis inside and we adjust the occlusion. And after about, I think, four months, the patient came to have the uh, definitive restoration. You can see that the tissue is molded and the abutment inside are uh, in good situation and we make the final restoration. In this order, the patient had no time that she, he uh, become intense loose all the time he had function aesthetic and we have a good result in uh, definitive restoration and final result. And you can see the uh, radiography and the bone level that was good. It's another case. Uh, it's uh, a case that we can have some compensation in uh, accuracy of surgery. You can see the pre op the patient and we have a, a scan out of the uh, oral uh, mouse and it's a uh, CBCT. We emerge them together and we plant about the uh, implant position according to the next prosthesis. Here is the digital surgical guide. After that, in the software, we have the OT equator abutment inside and we put a scan body under. It's like that we have a pre-surgical virtual impression here. And the technician can uh, plan for the prosthesis for us. You can see here is tie base according to the uh, height and to the space that we have. And there is a uh, design for framework here, a framework out of fiberglass and uh, a PMMA coverage over it. In order to be more strong, uh, they both are milled. And after that, you can see here, here is the titanium based abutment. Here is the frame and the PMM model. The frame to PMM, uh, the frame is cemented to PMMA uh, models. And you can see here the provisional illustration. If you uh, have a look, you can see here, it's a seeker, it's a flexible ring uh, on the surface of these uh, abutments that these rings can help us to compensate any inaccuracy in past, uh, surgery, surgery procedure. And after that, when the surgery is performed through these uh, surgical guides, we screw the uh, abutments inside and we can deliver the restoration by its uh, a screw. And you can see here the radiography. These stickers is suggested to uh, compensate the inaccuracy and have the processes more uh, passive, not in active uh, fitness. Thank you so much for being with me. I'm here to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashi. It was very interesting, very um, informative, and uh, very good cases. Uh, I have a question. Um, you mentioned articles, different results in the articles. They have, um, do they have uh, mentioned about the um, place of the uh, implant? I mean, uh, immediate loading is... Um, different for the uh, anterior region than the posterior region or um, maxilla and mandible. Is there any difference between these areas? It's no difference between maxilla and mandibles and anterior and posterior. 
It's important that we know the patient be the case of immediate loading. Means, for example, in maxilla posterior with D4 uh, bone, it's not the case of immediate loading. If we do immediate loading, we are going to be failed. But uh, if the patient be the case of immediate loading, there is no difference between mandible and maxilla, anterior and posterior. Uh, sorry, I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. As far as my understanding, you highly recommend for immediate restoration for the anterior sextants since the, uh, it's a visible area and as far as aesthetic is more uh, important for the patients. For my information, for the last case, you showed us a full arch restoration. Did you... Uh, restore the restoration on the multi-unit abutments or it was fixture level? No, no, it was multi-unit. As I mentioned, it has an OT equator multi-unit and right. with a seeker to compensate the inaccuracy in surgical procedure. In this way, we have two screw and we have one multi-unit screw to fixture and another prosthetic screw which uh, screw the processes to uh, multi-units. Nice. For uh, our information, would you tell us how much was the torque for the uni abutments and how much was the torque for the definitive restoration? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, for the provisional restoration. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, the torque value of fixture should be 30 to 35. For provisional restoration, it's okay to have 15, up to 20, right. not right. more, because it can lead to a rotation of the fixture inside the jaw. Right. And it's okay for 15 Newton centimeters. Right. So we go with the hand torque. So later on, yes. when you want to remove the processes, so you are able to unscrew and without any uh, removal torque to the fixtures. So uh, did you uh, remove the, these multi-unit abutments for the definitive restorations or you restore uh, for the final restoration with, at the top of the abutments? Uh, it's optional, you can remove it or no, you can uh, let it be in place and you can get abutment level impression for next prosthesis. It's according nice. to the patient situation. I prefer to remove it in order to have a level, a direct level to fixture, but it's according to case can be different. Great. Uh, again, for my information, do you have scan body for the multi-unit abutments in the market? Is it available? Yes, yes. There are some scan bodies for multi-unit abutments. Right, so it adds some uh, more cost for the patients, but uh, they can take advantage of the result and of the immediate provisional restoration. Yes, Great. Sure. Uh, I don't see any questions here, so we move on with the next lecturer. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Atri. It was very grateful to have you, you here and looking forward to see you next year. Thank you so much for uh, being me here. Thank you. Goodbye. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure. All right, the next lecturer is Dr. Mohajiri. She's prosthodontist, assistant professor of Department of Prosthodontics, School of Dentistry, Tehran University Medical Science. Her topic for now is implant surgical guides from past to the present. Uh, Dr. Massa, please move on. All right, we have a couple of seconds here. Uh, we have wonderful lectures. No, actually we are almost on time. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, please move on. We do hear you. Is everything right? Go ahead, yes. 
Okay. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, happy to be here today with you. I'm sure uh, you have enjoyed uh, the previous presentations. Uh, my presentation is about uh, implant surgical guides from the conventional ones to the newly digital surgical guides. But according to our short course topic, my focus today is mostly on digitally designed uh, surgical guides. Okay. Dental implants have become a treatment option widely used for a replacement of uh, lost teeth. The development of dental implants has uh, had a major impact on the patients, and the implant-supported oral restora restorations have become an increasingly uh, used treatment option for partially edentulous and completely edentulous patients. Even in patients with severe bone loss uh, and in locations uh, which all previously considered uh, unsuitable for implant placement. Advent of osteointegration has rapidly led to uh, use of dental implants over recent years. Uh, the success of dental implants in uh, the treatment of patients um, is directly related to patient evaluation and good treatment uh, planning. Accurate, restora uh, accurate restorative driven implant place placement offer important long term uh, advantages. However, uh, some practitioners uh, place implants where the greatest amount of bone uh, was present with less regard to placement of final definitive restoration. Even a minor variation in comparison to ideal implants, uh, uh, ideal placement, uh, cause difficulties in uh, fabrication of uh, final prosthesis. Traditionally, when uh, replacing a single uh, missing tooth, uh, dentists have focused on implant surgery guided by currently existing bone without giving uh, much consideration to the restorative design and aesthetic of the final restoration. Uh, in most of the times, the placement of implant is uh, not as accurate as intended. As I mentioned before, even a minor variation in comparison to ideal placement causes difficulties in fabrication uh, of final processes. Failure arises as a result of lack, uh, lack of uh, consideration of the uh, superstructure during a pre-surgical uh, pre uh, planning. Accurate placement is required to achieve best functional and steady results. Malposition implants can cause uh, damage to vital structures such as uh, nerves or vessels. Moreover, improper implant positioning can result in aesthetic, biologic, and um, of course, technical complications and uh, can in extreme situations render the desired uh, prosthetic rehabil rehabilitation uh, impossible to achieve. Accurate placement is uh, required to achieve a best functional and aesthetic results. Since uh, the oral cavity is a relatively restricted space, a high degree of accuracy in placement of implant is very uh, important, uh, which provides adequate, um, is very important for success of the prosthesis. This can be achieved by means of a surgical guide, uh, which provides adequate information regarding implant placement. And at the time of surgery, it fits uh, onto the existing dentition or even onto the edential span. The surgical template uh, enables a predictable and uh, safe, minimally invasive uh, surgery. Okay. Um, what is a surgical template or a surgical guide? Let's see uh, the term which a uh, glossary of prostodontic terms define uh, this uh, guide. Surgical, uh, gu surgical template or a surgical guide is a guide to use uh, to assist in proper surgical placement and angulation of dental implants. The main objective of surgical template is to direct uh, the implant drilling system and provide an accurate placement of the implant according to the uh, surgical treatment plan. Uh, to precisely transfer the plan to the operative site, a customized conventional radiographic uh, or computer image uh, guided surgical templates have become a treatment of choice. A surgical guide uh, is the union of two components, the guiding cylinder and the contact surface. The contact surface fits uh, either on uh, an element of patient's mouth, for example, a patient's gum, 
or patient's jaw, for example, the bone or a patient's teeth. Cylinders within the drill, uh, within the drill guides, uh, helping transferring the plan by uh, guiding the drill in the exact location and orientation. Okay, let's talk about uh, conventional radiographic surgical templates. The radiographic uh, template is the key to the success since uh, it allows to transfer the predetermined prosthetic setup to the actual implant uh, plan. Panoramic radiography is still the, st the standard for planning of implants. However, precise uh, measuring of the bone architecture uh, is uh, impossible because uh, they have a magnif magnification factor that is not always uniform. Therefore, a better assessment of the bone dimensions in, in panoramic radiographs is determined by the magnification factor. Um, conventional dental uh, panoramic radio, uh, radiography are uh, usually performed with the patient wearing the radiographic uh, template with the in integrated metal, uh, metal spheres, rods, sleeves, or um, some guide posts or vata perca at the position of the wax optics. Based on the magnification uh, factor of the uh, base of the base on the magnification factor uh, and the known dimension of the uh, radio pack markers, the depths and dimension of implants are planned. The implant place, uh, placement planning is guided by quality and quantity of the bone, as well as uh, the teeth for aesthetic uh, and phonetic. Several types of uh, surgical several types of surgical guides have been reported in literature. Some are designed for placement of a single implant, while others report present uh, this, uh, while uh, others report uh, designed for multiple implants, uh, implant fixed partial dentures, and um, also I can say uh, some surgical guides for implant retain over denture. Some of the most uh, commonly used techniques are mentioned here briefly. One method is to uh, prepare a radiographic guide uh, with a vacuum formed uh, template, with a vacuum formed uh, sheet. Uh, after the diagnostic backstop of the final uh, restoration, the, uh, after uh, the final wax up of the restoration, uh, duplication is made and a cast is pured. Uh, the vacuum form templates fabricated is, uh, is uh, placed over the cast and the edential space uh, with radiopaque material uh, uh, is uh, filled. The radiopaque markers uh, help in uh, pre-designing uh, pre uh, pre the direction of implant placement and in comparing uh, the angulation of radiopaque markers uh, with the available bone and also in, lo in locating a position of the vital structures to determine the best angulation for the implant. Uh, these radiopaque markers uh, can place in the center of the occlusal uh, surface uh, for the teeth uh, that correspond to a square axis hole of the final uh, or uh, temporary prosthesis. Um, the milling uh, technique uh, is an accurate technique in which uh, it employs parallel holes in the surgical guide. Uh, this technique needs uh, the aid of a conventional dent dental surveyor. Uh, limitation in this technique uh, is that it requires a special equipment uh, not commonly available in private dental uh, pra uh, practices. In addition, the practitioner needs a certain amount of experience and knowledge to use this uh, machine properly. As you, uh, as you see, we can um, use uh, this, uh, surgic, uh, this uh, radiographic uh, templates as uh, our uh, surgical guides too. All the conventional made radiographic guides can be, con can be converted to an um, somehow accurate surgical guide by means of this uh, milling uh, technique. Uh, what about the limitations? Are these uh, surgical guides and surgical templates have limitations? Yes, of course. Panoramic radiography, uh, which is uh, still uh, the uh, standard and widely used, has um, diagnostic uh, limitations such as expansion and distortion, setting errors, uh, positional artifacts, and uh, there is no information regarding the dimension of bone in a buccolingual direction. Further. Uh, 
further, these surgical templates are fabricated on a dental uh, casts. Uh, these casts are uh, rigid, non-functional, uh, and uh, uh, we don't know anything about the underlying soft tissue resiliency and bone topography. Anatomical landmarks are not precisely located. Um, it does not show the lingual blood vessels and uh, of course the dimensions that I uh, mentioned, that dimension in buccolingual aspect. Uh, it requires, uh, sorry. It requires more chair time, leads to a stress on the dentist and patient, although conventional surgical templates will allow the placement of implant guiding. They do not provide exact 3D guidance. Okay, now it's the time for talking about computer-generated surgical uh, template. To overcome the limitation associated with the conventional radiographic surgical guide, computer-generated uh, surgical templates have been evolved. A computer-generated surgical guide uh, a link between our, um, is a link between our treatment plan and the uh, um, actual surgery by transferring the simulated plan accurately to surgical site. The surgical guide is made uh, using a stereolithography process and uh, is custom manufactured for each patient. A stereolithography as, uh, as a rapid prototyping technology and a near outcome in dentistry allows the fabrication of surgical guides from 3D computer generated models for precise implant uh, placement. The surgical templates fabricated by this uh, technology are uh, programmed with individual depth, angulation, mesiodistal, and labiolingual position of the implant. Fabrication of uh, stereolithographic templates uh, require patients' computer tomography as abbreviated CT or CBCT image. In, CB, in CT or CBCT, multi-planar reformatting allows one to reformat a volumetric data sets in sagittal, axial, and the coronal cuts, and also help uh, building uh, multiple cross-sectional and panoramic views, uh, panoramic views. Uh, shaded uh, surface display and uh, volume uh, rendering methods generate 3D reconstru reconstruction of the entire dental arc and uh, their rele uh, relevant uh, structures, including nerves, uh, which makes uh, dental CT the most uh, precise and comprehensive radio radiologic technique for dental implant planning. Software is allow pra uh, pra um, practitioners uh, to, uh, to virtually view the implant site and plan location, angle, depths, and diameters of visual implants, which are superimposed on 3D data. Following backward planning, the di diagnostic wax up has to be visualized through CT scan with radiographic template in uh, place. Okay, here is a, a slide, uh, and here in this slide, we will see a complete workflow of designing a surgical guide for placing a single unit implant. As you see, the first step is uploading the CPCT and both uh, jaws uh, scans of the patient. Next step are uh, fusing the CBCT and the uh, surface scan. We merge this uh, two surface. And the next step is a virtual tooth wax up. After a virtual tooth wax up, we go straight uh, to implant, uh, implant selection and security margin assessment, which uh, can be done in uh, multiple uh, views to ensure, to ensure a correct outcome. And after implant placement, uh, we can have uh, our uh, surgical guide. And after that, at the end of the procedure, surgical and drilling report will be present. And our outcomes are a surgical guide and surgical and drilling reports. OK, uh, there are different templates. Different templates can be designed uh, for implant guided surgery. Each type has uh, its own advantages and disadvantages uh, that, uh, and its indication and uh, limitations. A simple way to classify templates is by, uh, uh, it by uh, defi defining, uh, defining their support. Uh, Someone like uh, mucosa support templates, uh, bone or tooth supported templates, or even a comp combination of uh, different variants. Okay, let's talk about two supported uh, templates. 
to support the templates, uh, uh, can uh, stability of these um, templates can vary depending on the extent of the edentulous ridge or the location of the edentulous area. To be, concert, to be considered to support it, um, a guide must not present movement or uh, deformation when pressure is uh, applied. Full stability is needed. And uh, so extended uh, edentulous areas or distal extension can uh, jeopardize a, temp a template configuration. Two supported guides are the most precise type of uh, templates when analyzing final outcomes, followed by mucosa support uh, surgical guides and uh, living uh, bone supported surgical guides in uh, last place as the most inaccurate uh, templates. Fitting uh, is fundamental to, ach uh, to achieve the stability. Therefore, it can be assumed that template design uh, should be extended to multiple adjacent tools to avoid any uh, displacement. However, uh, the degree of precision uh, increments as mortise are involved um, is questionable. A recent study demonstrated that the number, location, and anatomic morphology of the uh, supporting teeth can uh, indeed influencing precision of the surgical guides. Okay, here in this slide, uh, we can see an example of a tooth and a tissue supported uh, surgical guide. Uh, support is compromised in these cases as forces applied to the guide when drilling is performed. Moreover, uh, the scenario gets uh, worse uh, if uh, the flappers uh, rise, as a template lack of uh, extra mucosal support, uh, bending caused uh, by excessive force and even can crack the guide. Therefore, adding bar structures to the template design is uh, strongly recommended. Uh, in this example, uh, we have a patient CBCT and a surface scan of the uh, intraoral uh, intraoral uh, position of the patient. Uh, these two files are uh, merged together in uh, picture A and uh, picture B. Implant uh, virtual uh, place, uh, you can see implant virtual placement and uh, surgical, out surgical guide outline and the uh, surgical guide, which is printed uh, by a 3D printer. You can see the uh, primary situation of the patient and the surgical guide uh, adapted uh, to the patient maps. And uh, in final uh, picture, you can see the uh, outcome uh, in which uh, uh, the implants are in their correct position. Okay. The next group of templates are mucosa supported templates. Uh, in these uh, cases, uh, fitting and support is uh, given 100% by the mucosa. Retention is absent, but uh, can be added by uh, um, fixation pins. Patient removable prosthesis uh, must be digitalized and this process digitalization is needed to assess uh, three basic aspects of designs. Uh, first, implant position during uh, virtual planning. The second one is duplication of the occlusal aspect to determine template uh, position, uh, positioning using uh, patient occlusion and uh, duplication of the inner aspect to establish, uh, establish mucosa topography for template supported uh, guides. Templates for edentulous patient can be designed uh, in different ways. Uh, first uh, one is uh, one piece templates with uh, bite index. They are usually recommended when few implants are planned. And so uh, a slip design does not, uh, does not alter significantly the occlusal surface. Uh, an exact rep replica, uh, an exact replica of uh, the prosthesis is done virtually, and holes are designed for the sleeves to sit. Plus, um, if multiple implants are planned, uh, multiple holes uh, will certainly erase most of the occlusal surface, and the template uh, will not uh, able to be uh, stabilized. In these cases, two pieces uh, templates uh, with bite index uh, are useful. 
Mucosal aspect of the prosthesis is duplicated to give support to the first uh, template, and occlusal aspect is duplicated to, estab to stabilize uh, <clears throat> the template under occlusal force. Uh, both uh, templates are accurate, accurate uh, as if patient prosthesis is divided into uh, two mm, parts. Uh, this is the most uh, recommended temp template as the holes are uh, as the holes for implant drilling do not affect the anatomy uh, of the uh, tooth. Here uh, in this uh, slide, you can see an example of a two-piece template for an edentulous patient in the maxilla. Um, in the first and second picture, you can uh, see the a surgical guide with the uh, horizontal uh, with the horizontal uh, fixation pins and a bite index. The two pieces are articulated, showing that uh, together represent a replica of the prosthesis. And uh, uh, you can see patient initial situation and uh, template positioning uh, with the fixation uh, pins. We can fix the uh, surgical guide precisely, and we can insert the implants in their uh, precise location. Okay, and about the last group of our uh, surgical guides, uh, they are bone supported surgical guides and maybe um, the first uh, templates ever designed for guided surgery where the ones uh, resting over bone surface as no double scan was uh, used. CBCT can uh, give all uh, information necessary to plan virtual implants and create Sorry, and uh, create a surface reconstruction of the bone uh, for the guide to be created. This process is known as segmentation and involves uh, as a two dimensional CBCT rendering using tissue dentistry threshold. As I said, uh, no uh, image merging process nor uh, surface scans are needed. Uh, image merging uh, process, DICOM and STF files uh, helps the clinical get, uh, clinician get a better image quality, but it's not uh, necessary. Okay, moreover, bone supported templ uh, templates from, uh, promote extended flap uh, raising in order to completely uh, sit the Guide. Soft tissue is usually trapped uh, beneath the guide, so uh, it can increase a misprint. And uh, one of the other limitations is that not all software programs allow template design over bone structures. Okay, uh, for a uh, conclusion, I can uh, say that in order to achieve a um, successful final treatment uh, outcome, a position at least um, equivalent to the maximum deviation of the implant placement is necessary. This has been best achieved uh, clinically by the uh, help of a computer-aided uh, surgical guide. Uh, but compared to conventional technique limitations with computer-aided impl implant surgery requires substantially greater investment and effort. Based on clinical data, eMERGE guidance is not required for cases with sufficient an anatomical or attention and uh, bone height. Computer-aided planning and uh, image-guided surgery can be carried out when implant positioning is to be precisely executed, uh, and uh, when safe positioning of the implants with optimal use of available bone and uh, whenever a CT scan is recommended as a diagnostic uh, means. I hope you find this presentation informative. Uh, your attention is appreciated. Thank you. All right, great, Dr. Massa. Thank you so much for your wonderful You're presentation. You're welcome. It was full of information and also it was very fast. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so it be needed uh, this fast. Yeah. Uh, so if there isn't any lecturer, uh, if, yes, we do have lecturer, next lecturer, Dr. Shahmili. If there isn't any questions, so we can move on with the next lecturer. Uh, Dr. Shahmiri is online, and we are very glad to see you here from, from the other side of the world, uh, from Australia. Uh, Dr. Shahmiri, he got his 
PhD in material science and engineering from University of uh, NSW from yeah. Sydney, New South Wales. Wales. <laughs> New South Wales. <laughs> oh, alright, so, sorry. And then, uh, please tell us what time is it over there and which season are you? Thanks, Professor, for having me tonight. Um, it's it's quite uh, it's uh, we moving towards winter. It's a little bit cold. Right, uh, it's right. supposed to be um, not that cold, but it, it's this, this year, year might be going to be cold year. <laughs> yeah, so do you have snow we... over there? Not Sorry, yet. I think it's fall. Do you have snow over there or just rain? Uh, at the moment, is is quite sunny, but um, mm. it's is very fresh and cold. Is so uh, we do have some really cold morning. It it uh, temperature starts rising towards midday, but um, in the afternoon it get cold again. So <laughs> right, um, right. We we All normally right. have uh, um, autumn is not that cold, but this year we have quite a cold autumn at the moment. Yeah, it feels like, like a winter. We have. We had the rain last night and it's colder than the uh, previous year. So let's go to the topic. Uh, considerations of laboratory procedure in digital implantology. Reza, please carry on. Thanks, Professor. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. Um, as you can see on the screen, I have to actually share my screen first. Give me two seconds. That's better. Yeah, it's OK. Thank you. Everybody can see my screen now? Yes, we do. Yeah. As you can see on the screen, uh, my our topic today is um, I'm talking about a little bit of consideration in lab procedure when it comes to the digital dentistry. Um, of course, the topic is quite vast, and it uh, half an hour is just uh, very short to uh, cover um, majority of those topics. But I try to uh, be selective and uh, talk about some issues um, in terms of um, when we uh, fabricating or we try to um, gather the information at the beginning before planning the treatments. So I try to touch some topics and uh, give some uh, little tips for everything. Um, please bear in mind. Uh, this talk is designed to act as a springboard for discussion. So if anyone had comment or question uh, is feel free to ask. And I'm really uh, glad to you know, know other people's opinion and point of view. Um, my talk particularly re uh, relevant to um, those of who are dealing with the issue related to digital fabrication of implant restoration, these could be comprised from data acquisitions, superimposing issues, or um, guide fabrication or processes uh, fabrication. So um, I did not um, uh, try to cover the old digital workflow steps because um, most of the scholars and presenters um, did a great good job before me and explained it. So um, I more like focusing on uh, here and there, there is issues and, you know, how we can overcome these issues or how we can plan it to um, um, be more prepared in terms of treatment plan. So when we're talking about um, digital uh, implantologies um, and fabrication of whatever processes or uh, uh, required um, devices. Um, first question is, is that kind of treatment, it will be accurate enough? Um, are we going to get the result which at the end is acceptable? And if it is, and then we will bother to go through the, all those troubles to making, otherwise we will stick to the conventional method. 
Um, as uh, Dr. Habib Zadeh yesterday, um, she covered quite nicely um, the whole area of uh, what error might occur and which what what stage we do have some um, error in terms of implant placement. Um, we come to the conclusion is the system does have error, but still uh, good enough to be tried and um, developed and improved. And um, the only biggest advantage of the digital is that can eliminate some stage um, that used to be quite difficult and it was uh, technical sensitive in terms of uh, transferring data. Like I remember when we, we had the uh, uh, analog impressions, one of the uh, nightmare was how we're going to cross articulate different casts in different stage of treatment which with the digital is there is no issue these days because there is no physical models that need to be transferred as long as enough common data between uh, different digital files are available to be superimposed. So looking at this uh, error and um, the study at um, I referenced it on the bottom is um, systematic review, which is um, according to my study of, of reading that paper, it was uh, was following the Cochrane Library protocols. Um, Cochrane Library is um, specifically publishing and analyzing systematic and meta-analysis reviews with their own protocol. That means they they don't they had a very restrict selective criteria for accepting any study. Uh, so it either had to be um, clini clinical uh, randomized control or double blinded or single blinded. So try to minimize that biased um, result before they gather the information for a statistical analysis to come with the conclusion that what kind of the specific kind of treatment modality is feasible and uh, accurate enough. Therefore, when we're talking about errors, obviously uh, we're talking about stage of um, getting data ready right from the beginning. Data acquisition is a big part of the um, digital uh, planning, obviously. When we were talking about analog days, um, we had the impression as a reference but now we have a digital file as a reference is is acting as a, a impression of the patient's mouth for us. So uh, same as all days, if the impression is not accurate enough, the end result of the treatment will have lots of discrepancy. The same things we had with the data acquisitions. Um, most of uh, very routine way is to start with the DICON file, which just comes from CBCT or CT scan. And then you try to combine these data with the surface scan. But in most of cases or in big cases, um, that data are not uh, um, accurate enough to be superimposed uh, um, precisely. Like for example, I have here, um, we had Daikon file, which is one of the, my own um, cases I try to superimpose right from the beginning for diagnostic wax up. And as you can see on the right hand side um, image, uh, one of the tooth cannot be, the, the common area cannot be recognized by the software. So I could go and manually um, uh, superimpose and force that image to get superimposed. But how the question is uh, how much deviation I will have in terms of merging those two images together uh, in, with uh, having correct position of the soft tissue and uh, uh, the position of the teeth uh, consequently will be different, different when I have a different soft tissue information. Therefore, superimposed protocols of implant planning at the beginning is something that need to be discussed and need to be looked at and then see if it is required to be 
simple uh, surface registration or we need to have the uh, fiducial marker registration, uh, which I further explain. Um, um, if, if it is simple procedure is no problem. So it is obviously uh, the case is not big or we don't have any uh, me metal content uh, material in the oral cavity is not is any amalgam filling or we don't have any uh, old crown that's uh, made out of PFM. So the data can be um, uh, achieved or obtained by simple um, CVCT and surface scanning. And if it is not, um, the, obviously the procedure will be different. So that uh, accusation had to have uh, extra step um, we need to prepare for uh, having the SLA template so that can be um, those two uh, files can be superimposed correctly and accurately. So uh, these kind of things is uh, more uh, need to be looked at and think of instead of um, just going ahead and having CBCT and then and then they're realizing, oh, there, there will be just the discrepancy out of this, uh, after discrepancy will add it to the whole procedure. So like I explained, the fiducial uh, mark registration is just, I have a really simple um, um, slide here. So to start with a very simple uh, surface scanning, uh, or STL file we achieved, and then um, that surface scanning information can be used to um, create fiducial um, template with the markers. Uh, that markers can be variable. People use uh, sphere markers. Some of, uh, um, some others they use very borium sulfate liquid to you know mark the surfaces. Or um, got approach, it can be used as a, like endodontics they use for um, root filling. So these kind of things can be done, but for more precise um, uh, superimposition, uh, we need a marker that had feature on, so the, we can that feature can be matched and and minimize misalignment of the final. Uh, of, uh, two files when they come together. So that we will be replacing, uh, placing the mouth, the scan, everybody familiar with these uh, stages, and then that will be our initial um, uh, um, data that need to be used in um, combination with uh, CBCT. And then same procedure, or same processes can be used during the CBCT procedure. And at the end, we have a, a nice, um, complete file superimpositions um, with two different, different files. And also, um, sometimes it's not just about the way processes is uh, being made, it's just, just the lack of or the um, weakness of the system or the operator will not pay attention to some details when when they um, um, gathering the data. So as we know, CBCT had a lot of advantages. Um, most important, in my opinion, is that the data is isotropic um, uh, voxels in in a, in opposed to the CT scan. Because uh, you know, CT scan um, in a sagittal point of view had a difficulty to measure the distance between the detector and uh, the source of the X-ray, um, because that the detector in the CT scan is not uh, planar, is is rounded kind of detectors. So CVCT had a huge advantage in terms of. First of all, can have the volumetric kind of image by um, by a scan is providing, and and that the scan can be turned to the isotropic image without having different uh, um, geometry in different direction. However, it has deviation, 
uh, why this deviation will happen. Uh, although the CB city, uh, CBCT is a very um, good machine, uh, how we can minimize this deviation? The, the minimum deviation is at 0 0.3 millimeters square is, to me, is a lot. If, if you have a 0 0.3 millimeter uh, um, uh, deviation on one millimeter square, and if you are scanning the area about 20 centimeters, that deviation will be huge. So what we can do to minimize these deviations? So first of all, using the CT scans in dentistry um, that had ability to limit the field of view. So we don't have to scan the large area. So only scan the area that we need it. So these need to be discussed. Is if it is is an amendable, we don't need to scan the whole area of the maxilla. Um, uh, so that will be reduce the area of uh, being scanned. So that will help to uh, minimize the deviation and discrepancy. Using the uh, pulse acquisition technology rather than continuous acquisition technology, some of CBCTs that can have uh, a pulse acquisition, like they had a delay between each um, um, X-ray shooting, so that will increase the higher resolution, which give is better image for for us when we dealing with uh, superimposing. Using the CP, C, CBCTs that had like a 360 protocol uh, revolutions, not 180, that it, it will reduce significantly of noise of final um, image. And also um, be calibrated quite often. That's the two major calibration is the gray value and geometrical. Um, the, as we know, the CBCT uh, it produced in great in grayer scale of the image. So that gray uh, scale value need to be calibrated quite often. So that can software can differentiate bef between two different colors, which is representing different soft tissue or hard tissue or different tissues. And at the end, if uh, is available using um, more advanced technology CBCTs that incorporated other like a CT scan or panoramic or cephalometric all in one, um, that helps with uh, combination with the uh, um, artificial intelligence that you can recognize which part of uh, scan is the teeth and arch, and uh, also CT scan, as I says, for um, lateral view, um, and, uh, and the slices can be more precise and can help in combined with the CBCT to create them final and more high resolution, less noise, um file and image so once we we assuming all these been we've been overcome and we get to the point that we um have the image that we can um, good enough to go to the next stage um, and we try to virtually placing the implant of course we know the all criteria, uh, values that how the placed implant need to be placed in terms of available bone or uh, how deep can uh, implant can go. But as I uh, shown in the first slide, we already know there is tolerance and discrepancy around 1.5 millimeters um, to the end result and deviation is exists still. So maybe we should consider that deviation value to this minimum value, we need to add to this minimum value when we are planning. So uh, we have to, just knowing what deviation is, is not good enough and is how we're gonna use this on, on our treatment plan is important. Like for example, if we dealing with implant that uh, bone structure between two implants, we need to be three millimeters, we know that the apex uh, deviation is could be up to 1.5 millimeters. So that distance need to be a little bit more. If we 
um, uh, if we know we, we're dealing with a complex case. And uh, on the guide fabrication um, section, uh, most of scholars cover very nicely and comprehensively different methods, um, even dynamic computer navigation, one of the um, presenters yesterday were um, showing the slide and procedures. Um, but in terms of um, laboratory procedure, we're mainly dealing with aesthetic computer um, guided surgery. So we're either using pilot drilling devices uh, or fully guided devices for surgeons. And then the method is either going to be subtractive or additive. But which, which one of these methods in terms of laboratory point of view and consideration will give, uh, give the clinician or surgeon more accurate implant placement? We know CAD CAM has a higher rate of the deviations. Um, that's purely because uh, you're dealing with uh, cutting a, a lot harder materials um, and with uh, the system that had to uh, first of all need to be calibrated good enough to precisely cat and a lot of time in terms of if we talking about complex um, guides and um, just subtractive or milling is not um, uh, uh, good enough technique to get the old details and um, precise fitting between two different parts and plus, because uh, we um, are using the hard milling, there is a lot more risk of having micro cracks in the structure, which when it comes to the trying in the mouth is can be easily fractured. So as uh, literature says, is the most com complication of uh, um, guide fabrication is, is a fracture in the mouth. So you, you making, going all troubles to making that guide, going to the surgery, but end up either, either is not uh, strong enough because the patients uh, could not open his mouth or the available spaces is, is less or is not fitting properly. So that ill fitting end up uh, leading to the fracture of the whole um, guided uh, implant. So when we do talking about um, fully guided or partially guided implants, um, obviously, different type of guide is available. It's all been covered by um, respected scholars in past. Uh, we know that two supported and implant or pin supported surgical guides give more accurate position of the um, guide in the mouth. Um, but in terms of we have um, complex structure uh, in terms of guiding, is, um, mainly I'm talking about immediate loading that Dr. Marjorie was talking about. Um, obviously, interface between each part need to be fabricated quite precisely to can be um, placed over each other's for each stage of the surgery without adding any discrepancy. So we know the milling is not a good option, but for making those kind of complex um, um, stackable guides, what method of printing we need to consider. So we know there are many different types of 3D printing. The one we see in the market these days, uh, majority of they are SLA or DLP. This is what we know. The technology is available. And uh, most of um, 3D printing companies uh, moving towards these technology. But these two technology based on um, uh, curing layer by layer of the material, which uh, the interface between each layers is still um, uh, can create uneven surface, which affecting a precise placement of two different components on top of each other. So the new technology is emerged now, they call it continuous liquid interface production or CLIP. Um, 
as you can see on the image um, of one conventional D DLP and CLP material being cured, you can see the surface is quite different. And even in a small scale as 100 micron, you can see how much roughness been reduced by CLIP system. And um, if you go into the complex and uh, more uh, um, uh, big cases, obviously um, this is the way to go and use that system. Maybe moving to the design and fabrication uh, of transitional prosthesis, or I say provisional. Um, one of the most important things, especially in the big cases, uh, is how we're going to transferring that soft tissue contour um, by having provisional on 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 the surface um, to the digital. So uh, let's say you have an all-on-four case and you already um, uh, create a bar for that case uh, that bar had the tissue compression been designed during the um, cat cam and uh, initial stage provisional is made um, put it in the mouth tissue displacement happened so the tissue been removed and the bar with the provisional in there uh, and you scan this situation you removing it to place the scan body and to um, do your second scan. But soft tissue uh, is quite a flexible uh, structure. You can, it can recover from the compression it had and you go back to the original shape. So to mimic that um, tissue displacement um, during the using provisional and transferring that tissue information to the final uh, definitive restoration. Um, it is important to have a plan to capture those information and transfer. So how are we going to do it? I'm going to present a method. They call it uh, Sasada, Dr. Sasada method. Uh, it published in the uh, Journal of the Prostate Dentistry. Um, in his publication, have a small example that we can be used in with the big cases. Um, the important of this technique is that you can uh, capture basal surface of the pontic of the implant or whatever it is in contact with the soft tissue, and it be transferred to the final definition as as we wish, and we can um, make the final uh, definitive uh, restoration exactly the same as the what soft tissue or um, presenting during the long term provisional or any provisional stage. So in that technique, um, the provisional uh, or interim um, restoration was placed in the mouth, uh, screwed down completely. Intraoral scanner is used to scan the surfaces, mainly uh, occlusal surface, because as you know, a scanner uh, is able to um, continue uh, or resume uh, the scan procedure even if in being interrupted as long as um, that surface being scanned can be recognized um, by um, resume a scan that is a continuous same scan so for the posterior is is quite easy because it's, uh, occlusal surfaces will give enough information to to uh, the scanner that to resume and follow the area need to be scanned. So that uh, advantage of the scanner is used um, in that technique. So uh, I'll start again, place the provisional in the mouth, intro or the scanner started a scanning and the first set of data is obtained from this point. So we save this data and then we move on to next step, we remove the whole provisional, place the analogs on, on the provisional just uh, to be able to hold it um, for the additional scan. And then this intro scanner again, start uh, uh, um, uh, scanning the surfaces the all over the provisional, starting from the occlusal surfaces, going to 
uh, all areas, especially the basal uh, area of the Ponte. Once those images have been uh, um, produced, um, if another set of data of the provisional um, saved as a data number two. And then we use the, these two set of data to superimpose um, together in a CAD software. So um, we already have image of um, prosthesis in the mouth, and then we have a file which representing the only provisional with the whole area, even the area is, is in contact with the soft tissue. So we it's just very simple superimpose um, procedure, um, and we have enough information to actually superimpose to image. And then once we've done this, um, we cut away the soft tissue area of that provisional, and we save it as a data number three. Like I said, this can be used for any type of uh, big or small, um, which I show for anterior, how useful can be this technique. And then we go as a normal, we have a scan body, a scan it, we had uh, opposing um, uh, arch which is scanned, and also interrelation, occlusal relation of um, upper and lower jaw have been scanned. So these are another scan. A total six scan for this job we we done. And then as you can see, that easily can be superimposed that the blue representing that scan of the provisional out of the mouth. Mm -hmm. So that will brought into that image and used as a profile for final definition CAD design. So that it's done, and this is final definition. So exactly we, we know how much tissue pressure we're going to have, what kind of compression we have. What In case of if we have a bone level implant, every um, surgeon or uh, prosthodontist, they know uh, how difficult it is when the prosthesis come back with the uh, area around the uh, um, uh, neck of the implant in contact with abutments, if it's wider than um, flare of the bone, it, it will not allow to prosthesis to sit. So these kind of things can be captured from, from uh, provisional at early stage. And then you can decide if you're going to have custom made abutment or you're going to use um, uh, uh, tie base, which is the cylindrical prefabricated uh, abutment for that case. If you're using uh, prefabricated, obviously, by the time you're adding zirconia or superstructure in that uh, abutments, that thickness will be much more than the uh, the area the bone allows to the abutment to sit uh, completely. So these kind of things can be analyzed and known before you decide what kind of um, treatment you're going to do with, in terms of your final uh, definitive um, restorations. I found it a very um, useful in many cases. Um, yeah. There's another one. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Dr. Sorry. Reza. Yes. Uh, how long more do you need for? Uh, for the lecture, uh, Since you mean we have in terms a, of time? Another lecture. Yeah, uh, yeah we we have an, the next lecture online. He's from North America, and as you know, it's already late over there. Uh, how long more do you need for the uh, rest of the lecture? I am not sure how long I've been talking for. Um, I planned myself for half an hour. It's um, already thirty-five minutes. Originally, uh, we scheduled for half an hour, so it's already 35 minutes gone. Uh, you know, we are enjoying your presentation, Dr. Shamiri, yes. but, you know, uh, we had a problem with the, uh, you know, the, this is a live uh, a webinar and um, sometimes a, a little bit sure. uh, delays. And uh, now we want to know uh, how much uh, do you want? Do you need more? Um, to I would say I'm almost at halfway. But I could Ooh, speed up. Halfway. Yes. Uh, 
<laughs> it's oh, too much for us. To speed up and skip some of those yes, images. Please. Yes, um, please. And I'll try because... to finish it as fast as I can. Right. Thanks, because we originally designed for half an hour and that the solar is online. So speed up, okay. please, for us. Thank you. All right. No problem. Um, this, uh, like I said, is another example, the same things. Um, um, scan the surfaces, use that scan surfaces to design. Uh, eventually, um, that flare, to which was a stopping the original crown from sitting down, is being corrected, and now is um, restoration in the mouth with no problem. Um, in terms of plan of occlusion, uh, we know like is is important for big cases and anterior cases. Uh, you can name it different curves. Uh, what reference plan you wanted to go with in terms of um, um, occlusal plans uh, evaluation and how you're going to optimize your midline and how these old information will be transferred to the virtual articulator. So um, reference plan is obviously most efficient way is to consider into um, pupillar uh, lines uh, to determine the occlusal plane. Um, some of the system like three shape has a really simple um, icons that you could use. You could import the photo of the patient as long as the patient is looking at the camera straight with open eyes. And uh, uh, pupils can be defined into the software and the line crossing those two points will correct the image automatically. And then through this uh, midline will be um, determined even uh, buckle corridor can be de determined and ready for design. The more sophisticated systems, they can the 3D uh, kind of uh, face evaluation that the whole uh, CBCT and surface scan can be imported in same time and plan with whatever desired occlusal plan. So in terms of either you're using CAD or CAD CAM technology, um, you always have to know um, the way end result of the product, which it dictates how you're going to um, uh, plan your treatment uh, final definition, definitive crowns. So you're either using preface component or non-preface component or titanium sleeve. Each will have a different procedure in terms of the scan body and uh, preparation for your models. If um, fully digital um, workflow is not available and the model making need to be um, um, used in this technique, um, very important to know what analog you're using. You need an analog that is the specific features that it doesn't rotate. It, it's the height of uh, sitting is, is not changing and secure. And uh, it, if it's required, can be torqued down. So, and these kind of things and they also need to be compatible with the different um, CAD CAM design systems. So this is the example of I have here, as you can see, the features is allowed only one direction of seating. The analogs is from ELOS um, devices that can to, uh, help as a player to um, move down to, uh, the, um, uh, the whole uh, component in the right position and uh, screw securely without moving so that the final restoration when you made in this respect is, is secure. So therefore, adequate technique for accusation of data, uh, superimposed position, uh, superimposed procedure need to be done um, with uh, a predictable result and also be aware of the predict uh, compatibility of the system we use and uh, either using combined uh, milling or printing CAD CAM system, uh, paying attention to the method you use. And as we know, technology is still developing and improving. Um, therefore, always look for um, protocol through the scientific evidence. Any question? Uh, uh, I'm really sorry, Dr. Shahmiri. I wish we could enjoy all of you over the uh, presentation. Uh, um, um, perhaps later we ha uh, could have a webinar with you. Uh, 
Uh, so sorry that we, we have to very uh, rapidly shift to Dr. Uh, Sulari. Um, I, I didn't before... realize that time flies uh, past so quickly. I thought there's some <laughs> yeah, only been 10, 15 minutes yeah. of my, <laughs> yes. Uh, but I assume I started so a little bit late too. Um, uh, I didn't start exactly 12 o'clock. I think it was 10 past 12 I started. So that's fine. I um, thank you for having me today. So and, sorry. Uh, that's all right. I, I hope you uh, excuse us. No problem. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, Dr. Solari, uh, I think it is your uh, early in the morning. Uh, uh, yeah, can you hear me, Dr. Sulari? Do you hear me, Dr. Sulari? Uh, Dr. Sulari, uh, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you Hello. fine. Oh. Good morning, Salam. Uh, uh, yeah, Salam, good morning to you. And uh, I'm so sorry that um, you had to wait uh, for a while. Uh, as you know, it's a live uh, program and something like this happens no. always. Um, sure. uh, no, no problem. Let me, thank you so much It's uh, your, because of your kindness. Uh, Dr. Sorry, let me go uh, um, jump to uh, your... Uh, introduction, uh, introduce you to our uh, listeners. Uh, Dr. Solari, our uh, periodonti uh, periodontists, former associate professor, uh, Department of Periodontics, University of Maryland, Maryland, USA, Department of Periodontics, uh, New York University, New York, USA, former board um, examiner of the American Board of Periodontology. Uh, Dr. Sudari, we are uh, really honored to be with you. Uh, so please uh, carry on. Sure. I, I just want to make sure I can have access to my uh, slide, uh, share a screen. And. Uh... <clears throat> I want to just make sure that you guys are seeing my screen. Uh, uh, let's no, see. No, we cannot see your screen. We can just see you, not your okay. screen. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, now we can see your screen. Okay, can you see the screen now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, great. So let me go ahead and start. Uh, uh, again, it is, is good morning to me and maybe good afternoon to you. Uh, you. My uh, presentation is relating to the precision dentistry. That is a part of overall presentation of your program, you know, digital implant dentistry. Yeah. I'm practicing in suburb of uh, Washington. U.S. Capitol and uh, the uh, handout that you see here, I already emailed it to Dr. Farzin. So uh, she is going to distributing that one to whoever is interested to have a copy uh, handouts of the presentation. So, um, so before really I start my presentation, I would like to go back uh, to the history of why a patient is coming to see us. There is a reason that I would like to discuss that with you because we have to know what happens in the first place. And that is very important. Later on, uh, I, mean, I hope you understand the importance of it. 
You guys can see my screen? Um, Dr. Sarai, we can see your screen and the du uh, duplication. You have duplicated your uh, screen. Uh, There's a duplication me, of your screen. Uh, let me see, how can I uh, get uh, read up? Because I have three monitors. I, I'm just guessing. Yeah, yeah, that's because of uh, this. Yeah. Uh, because of this one. So, uh, do you want me to turn off one of them? Uh, let me see. Is, uh, if you want, uh, uh, if you, if uh, it's okay for you, it's okay for us too. Okay, that's fine. So let's go ahead and continue. So um, I just want to take you to the history. What happened uh, to patients? Um, do you see just only duplicate of it says why we are why our patients are coming to see us that's what you see is that right do you see yes. the next uh, slide yes. also uh, dr solari we can see also the next slide as well i and, see okay so and can that you would change be uh, on the top uh, menu you can see display setting you can see oh, on okay. the left side yes yeah, on the left side yes. you can see display setting on the uh, display setting please duplicate your view Okay, I'm looking at the upper left yeah. side. Uh, yes, yes, up, upper, upper that. Up to this. Okay. Upper that, okay. yes. The second yeah. one is display setting. Yeah, this. Okay. Yes, and duplicate it. Okay, I guess, uh, are you okay now? Yes, yeah. yes, everything is fine. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you so much. So uh, yeah, that was the reason that I wanna make sure that uh, we as a dentist, we know why the patient are calling, making appointment to come to see us. They have four reasons. I mean, there are mainly four reasons for them to come in to see us. I like to just hearing that from, from anyone. If they know, of course you saw a part of that slide. Uh, so is any comments for, you know the reasons for patient coming to see us i just like to hear from anyone if they want to make a uh, any uh, comment about it anyone are you hearing me okay uh, everyone who wants to answer this question, please raise hand and uh, we uh, unmute um, the uh, mic microphone. So, Is there anyone? Uh, who well, wants I have. Yeah, let me go ahead. I, I'm not sure if everybody can see it or not, yeah. but these are the four reasons that I want you to be aware of it. And this is really uh, we're going to talk about it again and again in, uh, you know, in the following slides all the way to the end. Patients are making appointment to see us because they want to have a smile, let's say a smile back. They want to chew because they lost their teeth. They wanna be free of pain because they have some kind of an issue with the pain and most likely their mouth is a stink. So really the main, these are the four reasons that the people are coming to see us. We want to make sure that we are ready for them. Uh, you can see uh, why I brought these uh, slides up for you to see and maybe hopefully participate in questions. Um, really, uh, we are focusing on that aspect of it, lack of chew. People are coming to replace the missing tooth because they want to chew. But before even we get to that part, I just like to know why they lost their teeth in the first place. These points are really important and uh, uh, you're gonna uh, come to the same conclusion that I came, that we need to know our patients. We need to know what happened to them, why they lost their teeth, why they are in pain, why they are not happy with their smiles. So, uh, so my next question is this, that, um, what are two, there are two main reasons that the people are losing their teeth. I'd like to hear from you if you know those two reasons. 
that somebody got their, you know, lost their teeth. Anyone want to participate? Why people are losing their teeth? And there are two main reasons for losing their teeth. I think periodontal problems and uh, caries, I think. Exactly. Those two reasons are the main reasons for people they losing their teeth. But now we want to know um, the, the, this is a caries, as you said, and this is a periodontal reason, uh, disease for losing their teeth. But uh, we want to know the cause for periodontal disease, the ideology for caries, ideology for periodontal disease. So what is the ideology? Um, is it microbial uh, sources, I think? Exactly, exactly, microbial sources because this is an infectious disease. Bacteria are causing this problem. But the next question is, is this, that how those bacteria are surviving? How do they multiply? How do they grow? I think they uh, should be in good environment, like, um, uh, like a, a plague, yeah? As you say, plague? We, yes, we call plaque. it plaque. Plaque. <laughs> Yeah, plaque, plaque yeah. in a susceptible host, but that plaque, that bacteria has to be able to survive. It needs to be, you know, most likely they are nourished. Somebody is giving them food. Uh, somebody is just help them to hang around, uh, around the area. So it's really important that we know the role of nutrition. Uh, what happens to the people when they are eating not a good food. They're eating fast foods. They're eating other kind of food that you can see here that is marketing on the people to just start their day with, uh, uh, you know, with coffee, with milk and sugar, and then other kind of a food. These are the disease that are going to be waiting for them. This is systemic disease. And just imagine the first line of exposure to those and healthy food is mouth and those bacteria that uh, causes problems. So if you don't feed them, if you don't remove them uh, at the intraproximal area, if you are not good at home care, most likely we are helping those bacteria to survive and damaging oral health and damaging systemic other part of the body. So what am I trying to say? We just not just to replace the missing tooth, but also we want to know why they, those patients, that specific patient, patients are different. Some patients are susceptible to caries. Some of them are susceptible to periodontal disease. So we want to know the patient. We don't want to treat the strangers. We want to know what happens to them that they lost their teeth in the first place. So when we see a patient, we ask some general question. Some of those general question is, who is the patient? What is their attitude, reliability? Can we achieve their desire, their goal? I mean, if, if we cannot, then we really need to stop. Of course, at the consultation appointment, we have an opportunity to modify their expectation if it's not possible to achieve their desire. So when we say, who is the patient? Is this the patient? Or this is the patient, these are the patients. So we really, we want to know, we need to provide customized care for our patient if we are going to be successful at the end. We cannot have a universal treatment planning for the patient. It has to be personalized care. And the care has to be predictable. Patient want to get some kind of assurance after spending lots of time, energy, and money they want to know whether you can produce the results that they are asking for it. Remember those four reasons? Either they want to have their smiles back, they lost it. They are in pain, they want to get rid of the pain. They lost their teeth, they want to have a chewing back. They don't want to have prostheses that leave foot impactions. So their mouth is going to have a bad breath. So they don't want to have that kind of a conditions. So they are coming to you. You have to listen to them. 
and you have to look at the dental history, medical history, if you really want to produce a result that is acceptable to them, and you're going to be proud of what you did for the patient. So again, uh, these three Ps are very important, personalized care, preventive care, and predictable care. So how do we start? Again, that was a general question, whether our patient is carry susceptible or periodontal disease susceptible. We need to gather information. We make our diagnosis based on the gathering the information. We want to have everything to be provided to us before we started. If someone coming to see me and asking me to place the implant on upper left side because the tooth is missing, as you can, you can see on this FMS, full mouth series x-ray, I want to have a FMS entire area. I don't want to have only one PA on this area because patient is asking me to focus only on upper left. If this is my patient, I really want to get rid of this patient as soon as possible. This is liability in your practice. You don't want to have any patient like this. You know, uh, this is a severe periodontal disease. No prosthesis should be delivered to this kind of a patient. And it really is, is a liability. You are supervising and neglect for this patient if you have somebody like that in your practice. So we take a FMS, we gather all the information. We use diagnostic tools to come up with a diagnosis. Is a diagnosis is localized problem or is a generalized problem? If it's a generalized, is it mild problem, moderate problem, or severe problems? <clears throat> so now we need to ask a specific question. Is this patient's medical history is under control? And this is very, very important. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you some more about this part of the uh, medical history and current history about the patient. Otherwise, you deliver a prosthesis so expensive to the patient, and you see the signs of failure, and you don't know what happens, and you felt that all of your diagnosis was correct. So uh, this patient on the left side, Scaling root planning was done, and as you can see, an excellent result was achieved, but not for this patient. Why not? What happens? Why we cannot get swelling under control? Why the condition is not as good improving as you can see here? Anybody can give me just some reasons why we get good result for one patient, but not good result or, or poor outcome for another patient. Any comment? Uh, um, uh, our audiences can uh, open their microphone and talk. Uh, you can uh, turn on your microphone and talk. Ms. Zainab uh, Abdul Hadi. Turn on your microphone and talk. Um, yeah. Okay, that's okay. I, I guess. Uh, 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 someone just... uh, wrote something, but um, oh. unfortunately, I can't see it. Uh, someone wrote okay. something. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, we will try it later. Okay, no problem. So these are could be uh, reasons for a patient not responding to your treatment could be because patient has a poor oral hygiene. Maybe there are some iatrogenic dentistry was done and there are some local factors, some calculus left behind. Maybe bacteria invaded soft tissue. Maybe there is systemic disease that is going on. Maybe patient is taking medications. Uh, maybe patient is a smoker, maybe there is occlusal trauma. There are many, many reasons that you may not get a good result or, or average result that you expected. You may, uh, you know, so that's why you want to know, you know, you want to know it. But if you already gather the information in the first place, you don't make any mistakes at this point and you don't become surprised that why you didn't get the same result as you expected to get. 
So now I'm talking about replacement of missing teeth. We're talking about partial edentialism. Okay, so little by little, we get to the idea of precision dentistry. If the patient, let's say, based on the Academy of Prostodontics classification of partial edentialism, if one, someone is in the class one is more ideal condition, such as this one that you can see, is only one tooth is missing. So is only one quadrant, is only one tooth is missing, still, occlusion is under control to some extent is is uh, you know we are dealing with the uh, there is no compromise situation is if there is anything it would be a very mild form of it uh, adjacent teeth are look to be okay they don't need to have extensive treatment to be done for them uh, so is considered to be from uh, therapeutic prognosis, which means producing an acceptable and good result, this is most likely we can do it uh, if we have a good CBCT supposedly, because it's not just only saying we have room to place an implant, but also we want to know where is the uh, vital structure, where is an inferior alveolar nerve is. At the same time, we want to know about quality and quantity of the bone. Having a panorax may not give us everything that we want. But again, we expect to be able to produce result. Yes, there is some ridge deformity. There is some uh, maybe supra eruption, migration of other teeth, but is more manageable. We can predict that we can uh, produce uh, what uh, result that would be acceptable to the patient. However, here, in this case, as a class two is moder moderately compromised location and extent of the arch because we are dealing with two different quadrants. One of the quadrant is very close to the sinus. So, you know, we, now the case is becoming moderately compromised. We want to know about the occlusal scheme. We want to know about ridge, how ridge is uh, shrunk, how the ridge is uh, deformed, and what other works has to be done. Uh, so we start to using more additional diagnostic tools from here and after. Now we are dealing with class three, which is more teeth are lost. Most, more than three teeth is lost on posterior area and more than one quadrant. So extent of missing teeth is now extensive. Condition of abutment teeth is, is uh, some of them are questionable. We need to know about residual reach. We want to know about the uh, occlusal scheme. So this becomes like, uh, you know, uh, substantial compromised conditions. So in this case, maybe additional diagnostic tools would help us to make less mistakes and to be more accurate and precise of replacing missing teeth. Now we have uh, uh, the, the last one, which is class four, is all quadrants that are missing teeth and remaining teeth are not looking good. They may need to have a crown lengthening to be done. They may need to have a root canal to be done. So is uh, is considered to be very uh, severe compromise. So for when we have a case that is severely compromised, there is a problem in this case, uh, and it's not you cannot use your eyes and hand and brain to replace all the missing teeth because you don't have really all the information that you need to have. The last one is fully edentulous patient. And fully edentulous patient, you cannot have free hand to place the implant. It's much more complex that, than you can just use free hand to do it. Same thing with this class three. So uh, the more um, uh, uh, complexity of the case and compromise the and edentulism, the more you may be needing to have additional uh, diagnostic tools to be able to treatment plan a case, 
and to execute that treatment plan. Please uh, stop me at any time if you have any questions. So no, these are, you. sure. These are the problems if you want to rely on your brain, only your brain, eye, or hand only. These are the limitations that you are going to have if you want to you know, rely on only that one. There is a really judgmental errors by anyone that they want to rely only on their brain. You know, some doctors I see in just about every country, they have overconfidence in their ability to do the job. Maybe they can get by with one or two of them, but sooner or later is going to be a problem and that problem would magnify itself later on. <clears throat> if you want to rely only on your eyes, we all know the mouth is a small place to put your fingers in, your assistant fingers in, suction, high suction, a slow you know, suction. There is a cheek, there is a tongue, there is a lips, the adjacent teeth already shifted, migrated, the handpiece has to go in, and there is a bird to the handpiece. Yeah. There are so many um, area that can be blocked by your eyes to be able to see it. Same thing with the hand. And many times I try to place the implant on posterior region and because of migration of adjacent teeth, even though that I wanted to place it vertically in a proper orientation, but I couldn't place it because there was so unusual uh, uh, and not accessible for me uh, to be able to use everything that I wish to be accomplished. So uh, these are the, you know, difficulty to just rely only on brain, eye, and hands. So uh, we need to have uh, additional diagnostic tools. Freehand misdirection is very expensive. I'm sure you had the patient, and I'm sure all of us, our implants fail. And it's really expensive because patient really losing faith in a doctor who had a failed implant. They start to losing trust in that office. You have to defend yourself why it failed. I mean, you know, you have to learn from your mistakes so you don't make the same mistakes twice. This is really important. So, you know, problems in dental implant surgery is narrow space, site obstruction, inaccurate positioning, and high requirement of, you know, expectation of the doctor to perform uh, that task. So look at the outcome. You know, if you're using freehand, this, you shouldn't be surprised if, of if this is the outcome. So remember, again, we go back to that four reasons that patients are coming to see us. One of the reasons is lack of chewing, but yes, you give them teeth, but is this cleansable? Is patient is happy about that one or not? So really there are many reasons this patient would have continuously having food trap. This patient doesn't have a quality of soft tissue. We, the prosthesis is not conducive to self-perform oral hygiene. So do you think patient would be happy? So this is, uh, this is uh, we call them XNAV. That's what I have in my office. So this is based on having a target. You know, you can shoot at the target. You want to make sure that you, when you throw something to it, it just goes to the hull, to that center of it. And uh, the, the, this uh, 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 dynamic uh, guided surgery would allow you uh, to go into it and would warning you that you are going off in terms of depth or you are going up from the angle point of view. Does not stop you. You can make mistakes, but at least it would be red. It would not be green when you are getting to the uh, vital structures or you are hitting the nerve or anything like that. Uh, so, uh, but I'll get to it. What are the problems with uh, new technology? So, the really the uh, one of the aim of presentation 
this morning for me or this afternoon for you is avoidable problems in dentistry and how to avoid them is much, much easier to stay out of trouble than get into the trouble and try to stay out, come out of it. It's not easy. The best things to do is just not get into it. If you, if you prepare yourself, if you have a good diagnostic tools, if you take your time to come up with diagnosis, to come up with treatment plan, personalized treatment plan, okay? And then you can predict that your treatment would be acceptable to patient and acceptable to you, not just the patient. We don't want to do any risky procedure at all. It's not worth it. Patient would not forgive you. You destroy the relationship between you and patients. I mean, you know, you just it's not worth it to risk it at all. So how can we minimize the risk? So we need to use the guide. And some guides are not precision. Non-precision guide is like this. Yes, you know to place the implant there, but you don't know about quality and quantity of the bone that is underneath it. You know how far you are from the, you know, you don't know even if this is the perfect position for that one, but just you using uh, next tooth as a reference for yourself to do it. So if you use the burr, and that's a pilot drill burr, this is semi-precision. If you really using uh, a static guide or dynamic guide, the one I just showed it to you, that would uh, improve your accuracy when uh, managing partial or fully edentulous patient. That's what we want to happen. So this article shows that same dentist, when he was asked to place the implant freehand and use a static uh, surgical guide and use the dynamic one. Again, dynamic one is just, this is the green, allow you to go to the depth and then becomes red and tell you to stop it. Don't go further, but cannot stop you. Just only tell you to stop it. So if same dentist with this article, you make much less uh, mistakes and accuracy is much more when you are using dynamic one, comparing to freehand. This is much more accurate and uh, less stressful to go through it for patient and the doctor when using this one versus using freehand. These are articles I send a, a, a handout with much more references um, to the moderator. You can get it from her. So let's now uh, compare a static in our guidance for uh, surgery versus dynamic one. Compare them together. In what is in, you know in what circumstances do you use a static one, and when do you use dynamic one, and what is the you know differences between them? So before you forget, I forget to mention it to you. Look, this is what I have in my office, but I just want you to see this. Your face, you are facing monitor. You are not looking at the patient's mouth. You placing implant, but you by looking at the monitor all the time. So you must have a really steady hand. If your hand is shaking, if you cannot make it straight, you cannot stabilizing that one, you can, can make mistakes. And these are hand pieces, and this needs to be calibrated all the time. This is really a, a problematic situation because you have to um, calibrating that one, uh, you know, off and on. Let's say you are placing implant on the um, lower right side of the patient. You must have teeth on the lower left side of the patient to use the clip. Clip is just, that's how you go. Where to place the implant, you put it in under those existing teeth that's supposed to be healthy teeth, strong teeth, not loose teeth, not broken down teeth, on the opposite side that you are placing implant. You hold it there, you're stabilizing that one. You want to make sure it does not move. Then send the patient to get a CBCT. Patient come back. You're calibrating 
uh, this and then by looking at the monitor by placing the uh, your handpiece um, in a patient's mouth you know then I start to uh, you know uh, placing the implant but uh, the problem is this that, that uh, you are on the right side of the patient you are placing on the left hand and you are looking at the monitor to do it so you know maybe newer generation that yeah, they used to play uh, with their uh, cell phone different kind of a game playing they maybe get used to this kind of a uh, devices much easier but really three of us my neighbor or our surgeon and there is a general dentist and myself we purchased this a few years ago and all of us we feel uh, dynamic one even though that we love it even though that is reduces our anxiety and we are from precision, precision point of view is good, but at the same time, it's really slow us down. The learning curve for it is just is, is not easy. You have to have a loyal staff because it's a big training for them. But if those staff are not there tomorrow, then you have to start from scratch. So anytime that really investing on a new technology, you have to ask yourself, is this technology make the life easier for me? Long term, is it uh, is economically speaking, is it uh, uh, make sense to invest on it or not? So uh, I'll get to it a little bit more later on. But looking at this, I I actually I placed uh, one of these static uh, guidance surgery recently for full mouth uh, uh, workup. Um, you know, this is one of the advantage of a static. Uh, surgical guide is you can do it multiple quadrants. To me, this is really important. You cannot do this with the dynamic one and you cannot doing that with the robotic one. None of them is can do as good as a static one because in a static, you, you know, stabilizing that one you know, with this uh, uh, fixation screw and as long as it's stable, then you can place the implant in entire upper jaw, entire lower jaw in one appointment. But dynamic, you can just work only in one quadrant. You have to have a teeth in other area to use your clip to hook to it. Really, at least in my hand, uh, a dynamic guy, guide and robotic uh, guided surgery are not designed for fully edentulous cases. I, I, for myself, I think I need to do a hundred of them before I feel comfortable to use any of them for fully edentulous case. So they are mainly for partial edentulism. So one of the biggest advantage of static guidance is multiple quadrant at one time. Mouth opening is not an issue, but it's an issue for a dynamic one. And the other issue is um, at the cost. Really uh, for this one, for that full math that I did it recently, I spent $2,000, $1,000 per arch. And that considered to be very expensive to pay for just only surgical, uh, uh, static surgical guide. The other issue is take time. You have to have a CBCT, then you review the case with the radiologist, then takes time for the lab or whoever is going to uh, fabricating that surgical stent for you to send it to you. So one of the biggest advantage of dynamic one, you don't need to do any of this. Patient walk into your office and uh, you can diagnose the problem and you can plan to go ahead and place the implant without waiting for the fabrication of a static guide. So that's the meaning for dynamic one. So the topic of presentation was why precision dentistry? We, well, we do it because we want to minimize risk. We want to improve outcomes. We want to have a less stressful uh, condition for our suffer and for our patient. We want to spend less time in the chair. And most of all, you are restorative dentist, you are prosthodontist. This is the most important part of it, is true restorative driven implant placement. So all of us, we need to know the end result before we start to do it, to get to the end result. 
So uh, that's why it, this is in order to get to it, if you use precision uh, devices, uh, diagnostic tools, and you know you can get to that one more uh, accurately. So all the literature clearly shows that um, dentists are not as accurate and precise when they place implant freehand compared it to uh, guided surgery. In terms of position, in terms of angulation, and in terms of depth. So if you look at those cases, you can tell that is much easier to place the implant with a dynamic one and with the robotic implant guidance. We're going to get to that part of it later. The, the most easy part of for the implant guidance, you don't need to wait. Uh, you don't need to have a, a, you know any static uh, guidance to be made for you. You can just go ahead and plan to do it. So this is the digital workflow. Patient coming in, CBCT is taken. Treatment plan is based on that one and based on digital intraoral and extraoral uh, scanning device, such as digital impression. Then you come up with a treatment plan, and now is the time for the execution of that treatment plan. And the end result, you can print it, digital printing, or you can lab can make it for you to be delivered that to you. So it's a really digital workflow again. Uh, the, uh, the main idea behind it is just to make their life easier for yourself and for the patient. So what is robotic assisted dental surgery? This arm is much more stable, much more, and does not allow you to make mistakes. It just starts to disengaging if you are, want to go deeper than what is planned to be done. And same thing with the, you know, uh, going off from uh, uh, angles point of view, not just the depth. So, uh, you know, these are really advantage of it, but uh, at the same time, uh, we're talking about $200,000 or more, not or definitely more. Uh, that's how I decided not to invest on it, at least as far as I remember, or I know there are only two offices that I'm aware that they have this. <coughs> so it's important that uh, take uh, limitation of the robotic one as well. So this robotic one does not independently move the handpiece, resist movement away from planned position. The idea behind it is wonderful. I think really uh, this is what we are heading sooner or later, but again, this is not designed for you to do uh, fully edentulous cases. Really, we are not in that level. Very limited data is available about, you know, um, benefit of it on a long-term basis. So is it expensive to have a dynamic one, you know, like XNAV that I have, or this robotic one? Is it expensive? Yes, it is expensive. Is it worth to do the investment? I think it's worth it to do investment because complications and failing implants is on the rise and is very expensive. It really is very, very expensive when implant get lost. You have to do it over and then patient are just a start to questioning your ability in the first place to diagnose the problem. Something went wrong with your diagnosis and treatment planning. So I want to uh, really uh, go into uh, some form of the conclusion. Um, again, one more time, um, I usually my presentation is uh, participation. We take time, we wait to hearing from everyone, and then we see how the audience is, you know, participate with it. So. Uh, it seems to be a little bit quicker uh, to get to the conclusion, but so uh, this is the story. Patients are eating uh, almost all day long now. It's not historically there was only three meals per day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, but now all the marketings. I mean, look at the 
the number of the restaurants that open up in ta- past 10 years, whether it's in America or is in Iran, it's just too many of them are there. They're encouraging people to dining out. That's again, as your health. Uh, you need to cook your own food. So you have a control of what you are eating. So patients are eating really f- much more frequently now than before. We are feeding bacteria in our mouth, bacteria causing periodontal disease and caries. So uh, I, I, to my you know, feeling, um, we are treating patients' conditions, whether it's missing teeth, um, whether it's a pain or whatever the condition is, not always, but most of the times I feel that we are treating a patient's condition as a result of their poor lifestyle. That really this is get to the bottom of it. Uh, so missing teeth is replaced with denture, with fixed bridge or implant. Uh, I, I get this kind of a comment in my consent form for everybody. I tell patient that uh, you are asking for implant. Implant, just like a natural teeth, can get gum disease. And it is much weaker than natural teeth to resist infection. I feel that still conventional crown and bridges should be used in many situations. And we should not jump into it and removing teeth to place an implant. We are not really ready for it to duplicate what mother nature gave us. Patients are not coming to see us to get screws, pitch, placed in their jaw. They came to get a tooth to be replaced that is lost for whatever reason in the past. We want to know what is the patient expectation in the first place. Either we can meet their expectation or not. If not, at the time of consultation is a moment that we can modify their expectation. That's the best time to do it. Either you modify their expectation or you give up of doing that. There are patients that you don't want it to treat. Some cases are trouble cases that you want to stay away from it. So that's a sign of really maturity in your profession that you stay away from some cases. You don't even start. You see it is beyond your comfort zone or patient is a troublemaker case or the case itself is a trouble case to finish. So do not treat a stranger and you know, if you cannot modify patient expectation, don't start. So you want to know who is the patient, what is the patient attitude. You don't want to end up with something like that. So avoidable problems in dentistry and how to avoid them. Patient complain all the time, you know, from uh, all on four. Again, see, these are the issues that we talk about it. And I mentioned that patients are coming to see us for four reasons. Patients are not happy with aesthetic. Patients are not happy with, uh, you know, with chewing. They have food impaction all the time. Prostheses are not conducive to self-perform oral hygiene. There was no l- lack of, you know, no teamwork. Some doctors, they believe they can have a solo flight they can fly themselves without having anybody else to be with them. So we see this kind of a situation all the time, all the time. So if you want to avoid that one, then you have to ask yourself, uh, did you train your patient? Did you tell them that, you know, uh, implants is just, we have to babysitting implant much more than the natural teeth, much more. So, the ultimate goal is to improve the outcomes, okay? To have less stressful condition. Be utilizing that one, a new technology for treatment planning, for execution of treatment planning, for having a greater accuracy when it comes to position, when it comes to angle and depth of the implant uh, surgery. We want to have a less invasive procedure. That's why we use the new technology. We want to have a faster healing times. If we use the, uh, you know, let's say put a um, 
a static guide, place the implant. Sometimes you may not need to flap the surgery and flapping the area and place it. So healing is really much quicker. You want to minimize human errors. Don't rely too much on your eyes. Don't rely too much on your ha hands and your eyes. So we can get a better predictive uh, treatment when we using new technology. And remember, this, we are not talking about anxiety only for the patient, anxiety for ourselves as well. So these are the really what the uh, new technology is bringing to us. So keep in mind one more time, again, this is my personal experience, that still we have to use a static guidance when it, it comes to fu fully edentulous case. Robotic surgery is wonderful. It has a stronger arms, but is not uh, yet widely available. It's so expensive. You have to pay, even for dynamic one, we have to pay $99. In America, we don't say $100, we say $99. You have to pay $99 or $100 for one of those clips. Just imagine this is just nothing comparing with the rest of the expenses. For implant guided surgery, for every implant you, you place, you have to pay the company as well. So it just, uh, uh, it may not be there for everybody to do it. So again, um, uh, the ultimate goal is improvement in patient care and treatment outcomes. That's the ultimate goal of using computer assisted implant surgery for placing in dental implants. Robotic, I think is better than dynamic because you don't need to have a steady hand. You don't have to looking at the monitor all the time. You can add the surgical field. You can add the patient's mouth. I mean, so I like it that way because of that, you know, so in order of, uh, you know, it should be this way, but I told you if it's a fully edentulous case, I prefer static over dynamic and over robotic. No clinical significant differences exist uh, uh, in some studies. I send you the references for you. So both systems are acceptable. However, when it comes to cost, availability, learning curve, patient preference, and clinical situation, then you have to make a decision where, you know, which one of them you want to be using that. Okay. Again, this is again is a part of the summary. Please keep in mind, teeth replacement does not come in a bottle. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, in a, when you want to fix your car, you just call and just say, send me a part for this part of the, you know, car. And they send it to you and technician put it in and that's it. You cannot do it when it comes to the oral health. You cannot just call and get a, another number 14 to be replaced. You have to sweat to get to that line. We are assuming, we are under false impression that we can do what mother nature gave us in the first place. We cannot do it. It's not that easy to do it. If you place an implant, this is the mistake that I see so many times that the size of your, the crown of your implant has to be the size of your body of implant. You cannot have it this way. If you have it, you're going to create a condition that is not conducive to cell perform oral hygiene. You don't want to end up with having something like that. Those criteria that you were told that, all oh, if there is a bleeding, if the implant is failed because it's loose, there is a deep pocket, there is a pus coming out, there is a bone loss. No, this implant doesn't have a bone loss. It's not mobile. You know, everything is good about it, but is unacceptable to patient because one of those four reasons that they came to see us, it was cosmetic and we did not satisfy patients because this is unacceptable cosmetic result. So one more time, avoid unavoidable problems in dentistry. You can avoid many of these problems or minimize them. Most of all, and you know, really this is the main, 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 uh, I think, uh, um, things that you have to keep in mind. Do no harm. You are not really, you don't want to harm the patient in order to give them 
missing teeth, or, you know, give them chewing ab ability or cosmetic. If you're causing harm to get to that level, you shouldn't really practice that way. And you know, if you don't, you are not comfortable about it, just refer and believe in the teamwork. Patients are interested in getting a tooth that they had, not a screw placed in their jaw. Use 3D imaging technique. And if your final prostheses are not conducive to self-perform oral hygiene, this is, you know, it's just not going to be acceptable to the patient. Patient, they don't like food impaction all the time. They don't want to have, because this is just everything is over contoured. All the implant crowns now is just, there is an overhang to it. Uh, it's just is becoming a problem. Uh, you know, to me, uh, implant, it just needs to be given much more attention than natural teeth. So we want to be happy, not just the patient to be happy. We want to be proud of what we do for living. We want to go to bed comfortable and sleep well at night. This guy is very happy. We need to be happy too. Not just the patient to be happy. We need to be happy too. So uh, this is my question to you. This, this is so beautiful, so beautiful. Should, who should we admire to? Who should we say Ahsan offering? Who? The pencil who drew this? The hand that hold on to that pencil? Or to the person that had the eyes to, you know, doing this? But you know, re really, uh, eyes is not the final because eyes is connected with the optic nerve to the brain. So brain is uh, helping you to interpret whatever you see has a memory in the brain of something and then commanding you to use that. So if you buy just a best handpiece, do you think you can perform better dentistry? Not at all. It depends who is holding that handpiece, whether it's electrical handpiece or is a uh, conventional handpiece. Mm -hmm. So art and science of dentistry really manifests itself in a beautiful restorative and prosthodontic therapy if you put your eyes, your hand, and your heart to be creative. Those beautiful churches that I, um, I saw in Italy or mosques in Iran, in Esfahan, in other area, someone loved what they were doing. They were in love of uh, what they are doing in addition of using their hand, in addition of using their brain, in addition of using their eyes to be creative. So we really need to make sure that we're putting our heart to create a condition that is acceptable to patients. So uh, patient can tell if you are after their best interest or not. Patients are very smart. You know, really, they are very smart. They know uh, the doctor who is um, uh, quality-oriented doctors or those that are you know, universally looking at everybody the same way. So uh, please tell me what is the problem here? What went wrong in this case? Please, uh, audiences, um, tell about the problem here. Our audiences. Oh, these are implants, doctor? Yes. Yeah, these are all upper jaw and lower left side is all implants. So what went wrong based on the uh, presentation that uh, I just, you know, I'm about to finish. Mm, they, uh, they had considered occlusion. It seems it is too uh, deep bite. So? And that's occlusion is one problem with this case. What else? And um, the other one Remember is- Remember to talk uh, about four, four reasons that people are coming to see us. What is the second reason with this case? Uh, 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 Ms. Zainab uh, is, um, has written uh, pre-implantitis. Ms. Zainab, you can uh, turn on your microphone. 
uh, she wrote that it's um, pre-implantitis. Yes, it's pre-implantitis, you know, at the X-ray level. And what else? In addition to pre-implantitis, in addition uh, to a fluzal hygiene. problem, uh, do you it, think this patient, this patient can perform the good no, oral I, hygiene? No, no. Uh, no, no oral hygiene by the patient is performed. So then what other problem this patient has? Uh, actually, it, it, uh, we shouldn't have, uh, yeah, or it shouldn't have begun uh, from the first, I mean, it, it shouldn't have been treat, uh, treated from the beginning. So what if, went wrong to begin to, to beginning? And you know, what went wrong in the first place? Um, um, wrong selection of the patient. Well, you no, know, we don't know. I mean, is it the wrong selection or not? But you know what else? Based on the presentation, periodontal disease. Miss Zainab is saying. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, at least based on what we see on the lower jaw, it doesn't seem to be that was main reason for losing the teeth in the first place. But at this point. By looking at this, those four reasons that we talk about it, this patient is not happy with aesthetic. This patient cannot clean his mouth. This patient is in pain on this side. He came to me with a pain here. This case was done with free hand dentistry. No treatment planning, no diagnostic tools, no, 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 just, just did it, you know, by using their brain and eyes and hands. And that's it. You know, and we all, we went to dental school. We went to learn, uh, and we did the waxing and casting. There is no papilla here. Papilla is supposed to come all the way to here. So cosmetically, this is unacceptable. Very unacceptable outcome. Do you call this one gingiva? Do you call this one keratinized gingiva? Is this a normal yes, gingiva? I have seen, uh, and I asked uh, our uh, lecturer, do you uh, care about the uh, cryotinized gingiva? Sometimes I see uh, all the um, uh, vestibular area has gone, and um, not only there is no gingiva, uh, cryotinized gingiva, almost everything, the mucosa is quite movable. So you care about the cryotinized gingiva at the implant site. Oh, definitely. Look at the natural teeth here. Look at the amount, the zone of cretinal gingiva. Remember, this cretinal gingiva, the differences between here and from here, the, the rest of it is mucosa, is the mucosa has much more blood supply to it, and bacteria can survive, can go everywhere when the blood supply is there. Here is firmly bonded to the bone, resists traumatic occlusion, resists toothbrush trauma. This is much, much better, especially for implant that doesn't have much fibers connecting uh, uh, the body of implant to the bone. I mean, you want to have some more of this. You want to have. But look at this patient. I feel really sorry for this patient that went through so much hassle, so much expenses, and end up with something that is not acceptable cosmetically, is not pain-free. Chewing is a problem, okay? And her, his mouth is a stink, bad breath. He, he's just spending lots of time removing food particles between the teeth. Why? Because everything was done, you know, freehand. There was no, no, no pre-treatment planning, nothing. So, I'm just showing you now how I treated one area, just only this area of the patient, because he was really in pain. So this is really problem with you know lack of teamwork and pleasant smile, problem with material and construction, poor quality tissue supporting implant. You know, so this is how I did it, and I published it. You can read this article. You know, this area is and this is really unacceptable. I don't call this one mucosa or gum or anything like that. This is, so I had to flap the area. I had to add gingiva. And now we have, we have keratinal gingiva. So I remove the implant. And this is the implant that was removed. 
So now we have this condition and we uh, placed the uh, prosthodontist placed uh, implant supported uh, uh, fixed bridge and uh, around this area. And patient now is looking like this. You can read the details of, of the case. I think I did it maybe seven or eight years ago. So these are the basic things why we should not, when it comes to more than one or two or three teeth are not missing. And especially if there are posterior teeth that are missing. So it's a very compromised uh, conditions. We have to be careful about handling a compromised uh, partial edentialism. Okay. Can anybody want to give me a comment about this one? What is wrong with this case? Uh, in the back side, uh, I think uh, the angulation of implants uh, in the maxilla is not correct. Perhaps there had to be some uh, rejuvenation, something like that. I don't know. Do you um, do you agree with me or not? In the oh, back, sure. yes. I mean, this is over contoured. So this is really they had to do it this way because uh, the way that. Uh, implant was placed. So there, nothing was into take into consideration. Those issues that we discussed today was not treatment plan. Those, uh, let's say, not even uh, non-precision uh, uh, type of the guide was used and uh, not semi-precious, semi-precision or fully precision was used. So th this is the outcome. So these patients are not really happy with their look of their mouth. They, they cannot perform routine, basic home care. They are not happy with their chewing. Look at the, look at the space, how much space is here. You know, look at the space on the other side. This is really after going through so much and now this is the outcome. Uh, uh, so, I have a question. Sure. Uh, at the um, uh, right side of the patient and, and the angulation of the crown, uh, it, it could be um, fixed either by rejuvenation at the buccal side or um, actually a, a cross bite occlusion. Well, uh, actually, a combination of both. First of all, this is a little bit too late to do rejuvenation. We have to remove that implant. Implant is is stable. See, these cases that I'm showing you, none of those implants are mobile. Okay, none of the, you know, so this case supposedly is stable. You have to really, uh, uh, the issue is cosmetic. The issue is on that specific area that you are referring to. Everything is stable from patients, you know, from the um, you know, problem is cosmetic and food impaction. A uh, problem is chewing inadequate chewing uh, um, ability to do it. So if you really want to, uh, you know, we have to causing loss of tra trauma to remove that implant from that area to put a new one and do a rejuvenation. Patient not willing to go through that much trauma expenses at this time. I'm just trying to show you the mistakes that was made because of not a good treatment planning was done. Okay, Dr. Uh, Solari, uh, uh, I want to continue um, and uh, to uh, listen more to a very precious presentation, but unfortunately, we are out of time, and okay. um, uh, it is uh, almost uh, two o'clock in uh, Iran, oh, and I'm, oh. yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I'll no, finish it up in, in just a second. So. Okay. Uh, the, this article is talking about does quality of tissue matter around implant? Definitely matters. These patients are all unhappy about the outcome. You know, uh, so one more time, we have to take those issues into consideration. We want to be happy, and patient is to be happy too. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Solari, and um, thank you for accepting our invitation. We were honored. Uh, I don't know how, uh, um, how to uh, thank you for being with us in our uh, program. Thank you so much. And uh, My now pleasure. I, uh, uh, and our um, audiences are thanking too. 
thanks for their attention as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Goodbye for now. Good night. Hope see Goodbye. you later. Yeah. Goodbye. See you. Bye bye. Uh, uh, dear audiences, um, tomorrow is our last day uh, of the program, and it begins from nine o'clock uh, till um, uh, thirteen o'clock. Uh, it means one in the afternoon. So we'll see you on tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, um, Everybody says that uh, your lecture, uh, Dr. Solari, was very fruitful and very, uh, very uh, great. Very.